call the Board of uh, Education meeting to order. Good morning. The time is now uh, 9.35. A quorum of the Board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of August 9, 2016 is called to order. <coughs> Approval of agenda and order of priority. Are there any items to add or delete to today's agenda? Seeing none, a motion to approve. So moved. So moved. moved and supported. Any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion carries. Introduction of State Board of Education members and guests. At this time, Marilyn will introduce the members of the State Board of Education and will ask audience members to introduce themselves as well. Let's begin today by welcoming Tracy Hordusky, the 2016-17 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Tracy is an instructional coach and reading interventionist at Zinsler Elementary School and Kanawha Hills Public Schools. She has a non-voting seat at the board table for the coming year, and we count on her to provide the teacher's perspective and to share her valuable insight of her years of experience in the classroom. So, Tracy, welcome to the table. Thank you very much. Marilyn, please do introductions. And since we started at that end, let me just do something out of the ordinary and keep going around this way, counterclockwise. Richard Ziley is seated next to Tracy. He is on his way. He's a board member from Dearborn, <coughs> and the board secretary is Michelle Fecto. She's from Detroit, and the board's vice president is Cassandra Albrich. She's from Rochester Hills. The board's president is John Austin. He's from Ann Arbor, and you've met Brian Whiston, chairman of the board, state superintendent. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the state board executive. This is Pamela Pugh. She's from Saginaw. She's the board's treasurer. And Lupe Ramos Montini is the board's NASB delegate, National Association of State Boards of Education, and she resides in Grand Rapids. Kathleen Strauss, board member residing in Detroit. Eileen Weiser, board member residing in Ann Arbor. And the seat uh, to Eileen's right is reserved for the governor, and I believe Craig Ruff may be joining us. He's the governor's education advisor. And if, as um, State Superintendent said, if we could have members of the audience introduce themselves. Marty, you want to start? I'd be glad to. Uh, I'm Marty Ackley. I'm the Director in the Office of Public and Gov Governmental Affairs here at the Department of Education. I'm Tom Green, representing MEA and a former employee of Kennewick Health, so I was <laughs> yeah. to see Tracy at the table. Robert Dwan from Michigan School Business Officials. Jerry Johnson, Calhoun Intermediate School District. Terrence Lumber, Superintendent, Calhoun Intermediate School District. Tom Gillen, I'm with uh, Measured Progress Incorporated. We're an assessment company in New Hampshire. Brandon Lanyon, House Public and Policy Office. Howard Galloway, former chairman for the Cruz campaign in Chiawassee County. Uh, Tom Zart, MASA. I'm Ann Forgrave, Michigan Protection and Advocacy Service. Ashley Chung, Senator Hopkins. I'm Shana Rothman, Michigan Public Radio Network. Chris Claver, Gong <coughs> Service. Uh, Caroline Lethan, I'm the new legislative liaison in the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs here in the Department of Education. Not new to the department, have Not been <laughs> here for a couple of years, but new to that position. Uh, Stephen Bess with the Office of Strategic Planning and Implementation. Vanessa Giesler, Deputy Superintendent for the Division of Educators, Student, and School Supports. Good morning, Kyle Grant, Deputy Superintendent, Administrative and School Support Services. Susan Berlman, Deputy Superintendent, P20, and Student Transitions. Good morning, Norma Jean Sass, Chief Deputy Superintendent. Good morning, Wendy Larvick, Chief of Staff to the State Superintendent. All right, for public participation forums, if you plan on making comments, there are forms for you to fill out. If you could do that and then get them up to Maryland, we'd appreciate that. Public comment is scheduled for what time, Maryland? One o'clock. One o'clock today. Uh, please note that the guidance for LGBTQ students is not on today's agenda for discussion or action. Uh, there are over 13,000 comments. We're continuing to do work on them, and uh, we'll be bringing forward uh, the recommendations in the near future. We'll be very public about when and if those are brought up for vote, so it's very clear that that action would, would be taken. 
With that, we are going to move to the committee of meeting, uh, committee of the whole meeting, discussion items. The first item on today's committee of the whole agenda is presentation on Michigan as a top 10 education state in 10 years. As you are aware, we've been working for over a year to develop a plan to make Michigan a top 10 state in 10 years. We sought input from a variety of perspectives and people from across the state, from the business community to educators to parents and to anyone else who wanted to provide input. Chief Deputy Superintendent Norma Jean Sass is here to share the details of the draft strategic plan and measures that we'll use to judge whether we're making progress towards becoming a top 10 state. Later in the meeting, there will also be a presentation on the Governor's 21st Century Education Commission, which is working hand in hand on the top 10 and also ESEA. All of those are working together uh, in our plans to make Michigan the top 10 state. The next steps will be monthly updates and presentations as we continue to move forward to become a top 10 state and sharing with you how uh, we're progressing in that manner. Norma Jean, please. Good morning. Well, I'm very excited to kind of share the next installment, if you will, of the 10 and 10 plan. And as you know, it's still not finished. Um, it's a, I say it's a very drafty draft because we are going around and seeking input from our stakeholders um, and we'll use that to go into the document. But what we're hoping is that we have it uh, more firmed up so that we can give people an idea of really where we are going and how we are going to make this actionable because I always say this will not be words on a page, will actually happen in the classroom for our students. And um, we also say if the old African proverb that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. It, we must go far. So we're, we're going together and seeking the input along the way. So yeah. And when before you go on, I just want to add, it's, in a sense, this plan will never be done because right. it's a 10-year plan. And we will constantly adjust as we move forward. The things that are working continuing and the things that aren't working changing so in a sense when norma jean says that i want you to understand this will never be done because it's going to be a living breathing document that we change and update as we move forward it, it is evolving and we use we'll be using our data and research and what's happening in the field to really help us craft it as we go um, so the first uh, page, and we have packets in the, in the PowerPoint. The first is the table of contents and things that we will have in there, but aren't. Um, some of them are in the document and some are being um, developed as we speak. Our mission statement we do have, it is supporting learning and learners. We feel that this is our uh, job, if you will. This is our passion for Michigan. On the next page, we have the, what we call the multiplication problem, and we truly believe that you need all of these things if we want to have significant outcomes. You have to have effective innovation, you have to have effective implementation methods, and you have to have enabling contexts. If one of those is missing and it's a zero, we know what happens in a multiplication problem, you, you don't get the outcome that you want. Next, we have our focus area framework. And this, again, we really look at as a multiplication problem. These four areas we feel are very key for our students and our learners in the state. We know that we need strategies and activities around learner-centered supports. We know that we need an effective education workforce. And we know that we need strategic partnerships with a very strong systemic infrastructure to bring all of uh, the strategies and the work that we do through that to actually get from MDE to the children in the classroom or the learning center or wherever they are. If one of those pieces is missing, it's like the multiplication problem. So we're looking at this holistic. You can't just say, oh, let's do a strategy, let's work on learner-centered supports and forget the other pieces. We just don't feel that we will get where we need to go. So we're looking more globally with that. Measures, we uh, tried to put the measures into sort of a framework and we call these the six E's. So we know that we want measures in early learning and exit ready, engagement, effective educator metrics, equity and efficacy. 
And looking at that, and we will come back to these, but we have multiple measures in each of these areas because we don't believe that children should be judged by one measure and we don't want to be judged by one measure either. Again, looking more globally at what we're doing and you'll see um, some measures that are comparing us to states because we know we need to have the big measures because we want to be a top 10 in 10 years. So we have to have those types of measures that compares that way. We also know that we need student voice measures because of the importance of that along with performance. So we're looking at a variety of measures. We'll come back to those. Um, the next piece is uh, going into the document and it really pulls out our four focus areas and the formatting is the same for the four focus areas and you'll notice at the top where it says top 10 and 10 there's a little piece in there that says strategic goals two and four all of these are kind of intertwined but we believe that two and four best represent this uh, focus area we have a vision and our vision is about equitable access to the environment uh, for learner-centered education. We know that we need academically rich and challenging programs that are personalized. We also want to emphasize creative problem solving, critical thinking, effective communication, collaboration, reflection, all of those pieces that are part of that deeper learning, personalized learning piece. And we know that we need our caring educators that um, use multiple evidence-based practices. Next, you will see a um, graphic that represents what we consider the key components of learner-centered supports. And again, it's that um, kind of uh, difficult space where if we focus on everything, we focus on nothing. So what are key pieces in this that we want to focus on, at least in the beginning? And then as Brian said, as it evolves, <coughs> some of these, uh, we will go deeper into them. But in the learner-centered supports, we want to focus on deeper learning, personalized learning, differentiated supports, aligned curriculum, and feedback. Then for the each of the components, we have listed across the top what are the strategies that directly relate back to the document. And then we have actions by role. This is not an exhaustive list and we continue to work on this, but it gives an example of that all of us have a responsibility with 10 and 10. It is not an MDE document, it's a Michigan document that we really, it needs commitment by all. For the deeper learning piece, we look at MDE wanting to pro provide research and materials and a menu of evidence-based strategies and tools and educator competencies around the deeper learning. We also want ISDs to um, help us by providing strong professional learning, districts and schools by committing to providing personalized and deeper learning experiencing and helping experiences and helping with the uh, parent education piece and businesses with providing partnerships and internships. So that's just an example for each of the areas. We have the vision, we have the components, and then we go into the action by roles. I am not going to read all of these to you. I'll go kind of quickly, but just give you a smattering of where we are in the document. Next, we have personalized learning. Here, MDE wants to identify and promote key components of a system that supports the personalized learning. Next, we have differentiated supports. Here we want to increase partnerships that address the whole child. We're looking at individual students here and their physiological um, and safety and relational uh, needs. We also want to um, certainly dive deeper into the multi-tiered systems of support. We know that tier one is key. That's what all students need to have and that has to be very strong uh, to support that. We also want to increase the literacy competences, competencies of teachers and of our learners, and that fits into the MTSS framework. Aligned curriculum, we know that that is again a key factor. We need high quality curriculum standards, and then we need supports for districts to um, identify, do the, is the alignment there, is it not, and we're uh, particularly calling out the surveys of enacted curriculum where they get a heat map and can kind of have uh, see where are they hitting the standards and where are they not and this is a teacher dialogue and we all know 
that processing and having the dialogue amongst professionals is really where a lot of the information comes from. Feedback is huge uh, with John Hattie's work and many others. We know that this is a deep driver and you will see it throughout the document. We have a feedback for learning framework. We um, want to co-construct professional learning. We want to develop modules. And we know that we need to ensure a culture of continuous improvement. When we talk about feedback in the document, it certainly is a part of teacher evaluation because that's the biggest part of evaluation. It's about continuous learning and getting and receiving feedback. But we're also talking about feedback in the classroom of teacher to student. We're also talking about peer to peer, teacher to teacher feedback and all of those uh, ways that we can get and give feedback to improve our craft and our learning with the students. Next, we have the effective education workforce. Again, following the same format, we have the vision where students have equitable access to excellent educators, where educators will be honored, supported, and offered opportunities to learn and excel in their profession and meet the needs of the communities and the students that they serve. Again, feedback is another part of this. We have uh, the components of this area as development of new educators and leaders, support for practicing educators and leaders, and equity across the field. For developing new educators and new leaders, we want to again refine the, the feedback framework. We also would like to develop a model system of training and induction, something um, that is based in having a novice, a practicing, and a master levels approach. For support uh, for practicing, again, we go back to the feedback and we look at high quality professional learning. Equity across the field is uh, conducting some strategic research to identify where are our shortages in the educator workforce and then plans to address those areas and craft policy and programs around those. Also, research-based competencies that are necessary for educators to be successful, particularly in high needs districts and schools. Again, meeting the needs of the community that, that are, is being served. Focus area strategic partnerships. Again, goals one, four, five, and six. The vision is about Michigan believing that strategic partnerships improve learner outcomes. We want strong partnerships that happen when all partners are equally engaged. They hold a shared commitment around what the identified needs are and there are clear intentions and defined outcomes. And again, we think that's really important to define all of the terms in here so we all have a common knowledge and language around that so when I'm talking about deeper learning or I'm talking about a partnership we all have that same mindset but we also know that we need to be clear about those and we need to define what it is so that we get our better outcomes. Components of this focus area with strategic partnerships are parent family and community services district partnerships, post-secondary and higher education acceleration, and workforce preparation. For parent, family, and community services, we want to uh, leverage research on engagement and best practices and design a toolkit and protocols that can uh, promote meaningful and authentic partnerships with parents and families. And again, I'm not reading through all of the other roles, but they are in here and they will continue um, to be developed. District partnerships, we're looking at developing and implementing a partnership model framework, again, with protocols for um, districts and supports that bolster academic and fiscal outcomes. Looking at our high needs district, how can we surround them with a variety of supports depending on their needs and truly work with them in this partnership mode again to support student achievement. Post-secondary and higher education access, we know that we need to expand the number of statewide articulation agreements with community <coughs> colleges and four-year institutions. 
provide post-secondary credit for advanced high school coursework in CTE, and provide technical assistance to schools to increase the amount of early middle college programs being offered statewide. We know that ISDs and districts, we need to reach out to our communities and universities and establish partnerships um, along the way. Preparation, uh, our workforce preparation. At MDE, we want to work with Workforce Development Agency to increase our internships and our work-based experiences. We also want to identify workforce needs throughout the state. And again, all of these things take the partnerships and the other roles of members and organizations and school boards and businesses and parents. Um, our last focus area is systemic infrastructure. It's really goal seven. And this is about uh, developing effective systems that are contingent on a cohesive, coherent, and aligned infrastructure. Um, Alignment is truly necessary across the education arena because we know that whatever we have in this document that we are going to implement has to get from MDE through all of our systems, also of partnerships and support into the classrooms and early childhood centers to reach all of our learners. There is um, this graphic that um, helps us to understand the infrastructure we know that governance and communication are two key pieces of this component, but also we must consider fiscal quality standards, professional development, technical assistance, data, and monitoring and accountability. All of this is to be more effective, to be able to scale up our practices and sustain them, and of course, to have student outcomes improved. Um, the next, uh, is another graphic, again, following the formatting that shows those components of infrastructure. With the governance, we know that we need to capitalize on existing structures, promote an environment that encourages customer service and collaboration, and agree to a common set of data and governance protocols by which we make our decisions. And communication is about developing a plan. Communication always seems to be that thing that's so difficult, yet so very important, and so we need to develop our plan around that. The next piece is um, a unifying framework, and this is, brings us back to looking at our areas of support and how they are all intertwined. So when we bring something through the system, again, we can't look at one piece. What are all of the pieces that need to be provided to bring something forward. So we have um, used the multi-tiered system of support within this to say, if we bring this forward, systemically we know that uh, we will use implementation science and transformation zones to bring this through. With learner-centered supports, we'll develop a menu of core evidence best practice that districts could choose from around multi-tiered systems of supports. Tier one would include some of the deeper learning experiences and personalized learning and the early literacy, key strategies and behavioral and differentiated supports around that. Effective educator workforce, we need to partner with our universities and colleges to make sure that our teachers and leaders know how to implement um, and know um, the power and the strategies and competencies around bringing multi-tiered systems of supports forward. We need to develop that new inno innovative new teacher framework where again they can have more experience in the classroom, our new teachers, with more supports. Uh, we want the feedback piece so that cultures of continuous improvement thrive and again we'll seek partnerships working with districts to provide differentiated supports across all tiers of the multi-tiered systems of support. And again, we want to be sure that we look at the whole child so that academics are extremely important, but many, many factors do um, affect that. And so we want to, again, look holistically at the child and our opportunities both inside the school and outside the school. Lastly is a glossary, and this is um, incomplete because we know there are many, many um, 
terms in here that need to be identified so that we all talk the same language. But we also want to include in our glossary not only definitions but graphics to help better explain them as well as some links. We have um, pockets of, of excellence around some of these areas. So we're hoping it would be a wonderful thing to be able to click on a link that showed uh, an example of feedback in action or deeper learning in action in some of our classrooms. That brings us to the measures and I'm not going to go through these specifically. Again, there you can see that there are multiple measures in each of these areas. Uh, we have NAEP uh, data, um, again, looking at where we are as a state. We also have some early childhood uh, measures. We have SAT, graduation rates, uh, post-secondary enrollment, proficiency. We have educational development plans as we look at personalization. We want to um, look at the Reaching for Opportunity report um, with the goal of post-secondary completion to continue to increase that across the state. We have, uh, again, suspension exposure rates, CTE participation, student voice, and I'm just going through quickly, there are more measures than, than this, but um, retention rate of our effective educators and feedback systems, national board certification. Rankings with that and equity, achievement gaps, um, and efficacy, we will probably need to do some uh, surveys and look at our implementation of multi-tiered systems of support. That was a lot of information and it was done very quickly and I hope that you will go back into the document because there really is a lot of depth here. We know that for next steps, we were way up here when we were developing our goals. This document is kind of here. We're still kind of big picture, but we're uh, getting deeper into it. And from here, we will have action teams around each of these areas to really dig into specifics um, that are more of the granular size to bring forward. Before I open up for questions, I just want to mention that as we have been developing this plan, you know, it is in line with the nine building blocks that other countries have used to really perform well. It's in line with what Massachusetts, Tennessee, Florida have done. McCrell has looked at it and, and has said it is in line with what uh, we need to be doing. Ed Trust, it's, it's very much in line with and the post-secondary access. So we keep talking big picture and that's important because if we want to get changes made from the department to the classroom, you have to put the structures in place. But in, in a near future report, I will have uh, Norma Jean come back and maybe give you some ideas of the meat of this in terms of what it really means for the classroom. You know, how we're going to look at doing uh, teacher prep in a different way, professional development in a different way. Look at what this really means for changes in the classroom so you get a feel for if you're a classroom teacher, how this would impact you uh, moving forward. So it is very exciting stuff. It's a lot of work. Uh, and it's, it's if you really want to get it from here to the classroom, you have to go through these strategic types of processes. So with that, I saw Pam, you had your hand up. I have a question. So the big picture, that included the strategies, correct, that you have noted here. It was the, the goals as well as the strategies, the align with yes. strategies. Yep is in that big picture document. Yeah. And let me first of all commend you all because I, I see that you guys are moving um, quite uh, uh, speedily to get to get us to the ground level. And then just the other quick question I have um, is um, I'm happy to hear you talk about continuous quality improvement. And do we have any means or any thoughts of how we can actually do some work in the classroom or in the building level? I know um, through the early childhood development um, programs, mainly the home visiting programs, they have a lot of CQI work that's being done through uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and MPHI, uh, Michigan Public Health Institute. But I think that that is something that if we could actually, I mean, I, I hear how you're gonna start um, that process, but if we could really get some um, pilots or uh, get some CQI at that level, and maybe it's already happening. And again, we have we want to grow some of the things we have and make sure that they're scalable and, and sustainable in this. And this document, we try to make this small enough that people would and attractive enough. 
with a good format that people would want to go into it and read it, but we also know that now we need to have documents outside of this to get to that level where we are more specific in what Brian was saying, where if I'm a teacher on, or a um, principal or whomever, I can look at this and say, okay, this is what I need to be doing in my classroom, or this is what <coughs> needs to be happening in my building or district. Can I answer? I think so, and I think as continuous quality improvement is put into a building, it kind of like spreads and people begin to think uh, on that, in that vein. So it would be good to have that in at the building, building levels. But yes, the, what you said is good. Eileen and John? Uh, and, and, so uh, this Richard is really a forward-looking, this is not a comment on the document, but I'm curious as to how it will be implemented because uh, Michigan does do state standards, we don't do curriculum. Uh, we have in the past done professional development, I understand, and uh, guidance to the field, to the schools. Mm -hmm. But under current legislation, how do you envision that this will be um, implemented in schools, uh, change driven forward, people coming to the table? Well, I think there are a lot. For one thing, we're trying to bring a lot of stakeholders in and get teachers involved and even at this level to get input so people feel that, that they're a part of it. So I think that's important. We also um, want to, it's research-based. So beyond working with stakeholders, we know that we also, that's our infrastructure piece. That's how we're going to bring it forward. We need to bring it through all of those channels we all need to be on the same page and aligned so we're cohesive we're working with the um, scaling up piece with the uh, nationally with the federal government they come in monthly or we call them our CSIP um, people it's been in the board reports they come monthly and work with us we examine research we are going to have what we call a transformation zone so some of these we will start small and scale from there looking at a slice of the state what ISDs like if we have three ISDs what three ISDs could we look at that are representative of the different areas in the state the rural the um, the large cities or small all of those areas if we can have a representation and then through implementation science start bringing these strategies through then we can i don't know if the word is perfected but we can live it and know what our strengths and challenges are in each of those areas and then we can grow it from there so if I can just do a follow-up question, uh, one of the questions I've been asking administrators who are using MTSS, for example, mm -hmm. is how long would it take to have MTSS be implemented in every state with our current system, in every school, in every, in every district throughout the state in, under our current system? Uh, they pretty much assured me that on a voluntary basis we'll be losing at least two cohorts of school children in elementary school before everybody sees what it can do decides that it's important to do, has the, creates the community support for this kind of a massive change. I just don't know how we're going to leapfrog um, uh, that uh, uh, having research-based, uh, uh, evidence-based practices sell themselves quickly so that districts will voluntarily start to implement this. I'm just missing that piece and I, I don't know whether it's uh, not possible um, to do more, uh, you know, without funding, for example, that's a carrot. Well, we do need funding and we do need a lot of pieces in, in place and I don't know, maybe it's the Pollyanna, but I think that MTSS is out in the state. We just want to make sure that it is, um, that we're specific about what our core pieces of that that really make it work. So I think we have places where it's going and how do we tighten it up and how do we learn from each other. So I think we need to use a lot of avenues. Um, to, to grow it across and you know we need to it's the communication it's really our infrastructure piece that if we are more aligned and if we are talking to each other more about what's working I think that it will go out and when I brought this to teachers to groups of teachers um, because to be honest my fear was that people would say oh MTSS we're already doing that you know this doesn't seem innovative or, or new and they all said that people might say that, but they also said that it's, it's very needed. And they can be very specific about what pieces of it are bothersome to them. And some of them 
our, our resources that they would need more people and some of them are more of the um, tasks to do that are more um, around forms and things like that, simple things like that that aren't simple when you're living it. But pieces that I think we can also work on and give tips to across. So I think our guidance out there, some of the things are, um, I hate to use the word easier, but easier to tackle. So we can work on those while we're also working on the bigger picture and getting things forward that will work. So it's just this multi-tiered piece. Then one last thing and then I'll, I'll I've started to monopolize, but what, what the one addition I could see that would make sense to me mm -hmm. is target dates for implementation yes. of these strategies. They can be unrealistic, but they need to be in there because you have building blocks that can't you can't go on to the you can't succeed at other areas without mm -hmm. finding ways to implement good communication for example. And if you don't have that in there, I'm afraid that we'll just be three or four years from now with an amorphous blob of some progress, but not against goals, not against time goals. We agree with you. Um, it's, and again, you need to have some time for things to work, but you know, in two years, this is what, end of this year, this is what we're expecting. End of different, this year, this is what for, we're expecting. Right. As yes. Based on the what we have now. Yep. Yes, yes, Thank you. totally agree. Okay, John and then Dr. Z. I appreciate Eileen's last encouragement. Um, and one, I really appreciate all the, not only the hard work, but you know, the engagement with the field, which I keep hearing uh, people really appreciate uh, that this department and Brian and you all are out there listening. And I am curious about how they're engaging with, with this work. Um, but my, I guess my main comment is by way of encouragement, I think and maybe more around how this agenda is presented um, to uh, try to keep sort of starting with the, the goal we need to move these indicators in 10 years to where they need to be, particularly those student achievement levels, student outcomes, post-secondary participation success, and, and I guess focus on, we think these are the major actions which are in here, though they're kind of wrapped in what is getting to be a pretty complicated structure and descriptor, which is, is maybe getting, at least for me, a bit overly um, complicated in terms of its articulation. It seems like a big machine uh, that it's hard to decode what's going on inside. Um, and so the, the, we think these actions in early childhood uh, uh, enhancement, we think these actions around better supporting teachers, you know, I would just, for me anyway, encourage focusing on the outcome and we think these are the major strategic actions that will move those needles. Um, that's my comment. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Z and the Cassandra. Uh, um, you can ask me. <laughs> okay. I, I appreciate what uh, uh, the board presidents just uh, articulated better than, than I could. And I guess an example uh, is on page 20, under systemic infrastructure, uh, there are two terms that maybe need to go right in the glossary. Uh, MD will utilize implementation science. What, what is that? There is a science behind how you implement things, and that's what CSIP comes and, and helps us with, that you have to have a knowledge base about it, and then you go out and you scale it up, so you start with a slice of the state um, and bring a strategy forward. So we learn about it here. We go out to the ISD and bring people from districts in, and they learn about it. They go out and implement it in the classroom. They meet and talk about how it works or how it doesn't, and then it starts over. We uh, continue to implement those competencies and those pieces that work. And yes, there are a lot of um, terms in here that need to go in the glossary that aren't in there yet. So is implementation science a, a uh, un, is it a commonly accepted a uh, set of ideas out of uh, sociology or business administration? It's research or? base with Dean Fixon um, started it, so yeah, I don't Can know I when he started. Check. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so it, it's also based out of a lot of work of systems design and engineering. So um, industrial and operational engineering is 
one of the early areas where this developed, but it was, it was, it's basically the notion of looking at the full implementation as it's going on, figuring out where the nuances are, that, where there are challenges. It's, it's based somewhat in some of the, the quality work that Deming and others brought to the auto industry, things like that, so that you're looking at all aspects of implementation from large, in our case, from large scale policy with the department right down to classroom practices and seeing where any of those efforts are either misaligned where there's gaps in, in implementation, gaps in resources, and then bringing that into a short term cycle to be able to then course correct very quickly rather than waiting out a year or five years as most schools do in, a, in an improvement plan. It's very data driven. And we, we used along it, the way. We used it on a local level and we used the hexagon model yes. for a parenting class and we looked at need, um, were there resources, were there chance I can't remember what Readiness. it's like five yes. points that we looked before we implemented um, a parenting support program. We've used that tool as well. And Dr. Z and the other term was transformation zone. That's when I'm talking about that slice that I was explaining where we are taught then we go to the ISD, the ISD then, and we're specific about the ISD has three schools that it goes out to and then it goes down to the classroom. So it is a zone or a way for us to bring the strategies from MDE through the system, again, the infrastructure as Steve explained, into the classroom. So transformation zone is a pilot ISD, and then you apply the lessons from that to the rest of the mm -hmm. state? Kind okay. of like that, yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Michelle and then Kathleen, please. Okay. Um, I, I want to let you know I appreciate all this work. I, I can only imagine so many different stakeholders or so many passionate issues and trying to incorporate all these voices and come out with a coherent document. Is, Ask, but um, but I did have some, I had some uh, an o uh, a specific question and then an overall question. Um, so I, I I'm looking at the measuring progress and I and um, and I, I know this isn't the, the final this is still a draft. Um, so uh, I I was wondering in terms of now I know you have some things that talk about measuring gaps for special populations, mm -hmm. yeah. but um, and specifically looking at special eds, and maybe that you don't look at gaps on test scores for them as an ad adequate measure. Is there some, um, and by the way, I really love the fact that this is a much more comprehensive, holistic approach rather than just a straight up standardized test score. I think that is a great move, and I really strongly support that. So uh, overall, I really appreciate this. But I'm specifically, I just didn't know how. Um, to encourage schools to, um, or to reward schools that are doing a, a good job with their special ed population. How to, is there a handle on how to measure that and how to, aside, because I don't think standardized tests are going to cut it for ma many of them. We know that um, we also need to consider performance tasks. They are not all listed in here that I think will, will help. With that, uh, we also have the achievement gap piece, the expulsions, and um, that piece also with our behavioral supports with MTSS, um, looking at those areas. So we do need to get down to some further data collecting. Um, do you have anything I, specific? I was also that? going to say one of the things that that we're looking at in, in terms of any of the implementation of of these specific efforts is we want to find exemplars that we have in the state. And we want those to become models for what we then utilize and, and can showcase with other schools. We've had efforts in the past around that through the beating the odds work and, and other kinds of things. This is probably then a more deliberate effort so that what we would be looking for are exactly those schools that have closed the achievement gap when we look at um, students with disabilities compared with the broader population. And we have those schools in the state. We've seen these examples. Then going to work with them to figuring it, figure out what are the specific practices that they engaged in that moved in that way so that we can utilize that in our guidance going forward and build not just upon 
big ideas that are research-based, but also build upon the actual practices that some have engaged with so that they can become leaders. That, that's part of the way we could right. uh, so kind of for, promote their work in, and success. Because <coughs> my, my concern is if, we, if we're relying on the gap just on a MEEP score or an MSTEP score or whatever the score is, that it's not, not sufficient. No. Um, I also I didn't see anything about schools reducing their class sizes, which I think would be a nice, since it's a, it's a, a, a research-based um, recommendation on how to improve, um, I think it's a focus on uh, reducing classes. My, my second um, point is you know, I've been reading and hearing and learning more about the SRO and that she's coming up or the, the department, whatever, the group is coming up with their own sets of assessments, which are going to be driven by the threat of closing a school or implementing a CEO. And it seems to my concern is that they will be, that will be what schools will focus on, is sort of the draconian um, approach, in my opinion, um, and not necessarily this holistic approach because they have a lot more to lose. There's a, a greater disincentive or incentive to, you know, focus solely on test scores and, you know, and, uh, Complied to the directives from the SRO's office. So how um, how is that going to work with, you know, I'm, I'm hearing they're having all sorts of plans to shut down a number or implement CEOs based on their own metrics, which I'm not quite clear on. So how, how does that work with the... So I'll, the I'll attack that. So that really uh, involves into our ESSA work, which Vanessa will be reporting on soon. But I think we're working closely with the governor's office uh, and legislative leaders to envision a future. So you've kind of got like what's happening, you know, this year and next year, and then you've got the future that we're going to create moving forward, and those two things may look differently. So uh, I I'd like to point that out. Secondly, the data that she is using to determine closing of the schools is the three years of state assessment data. What she does do, I believe, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, is that once the school's been identified, she does ask for some additional data on discipline, on test scores, on a short cycle basis. Uh, and she's using that to determine if there's progress. But in terms of any decisions made of schools in the bottom 5% or schools that have been in the bottom 5% for three straight years, it is the state data for three years. It is our test, you know, it's the state required test. But so really we almost have to look at here's a discussion of what's going on with the SRO today and next year and then as we move forward under a revised ESSA plan and we're working closely with Greg and the governor's office to try to have that a vision for that. All right, uh, I see I did have Kathleen, were you done Michelle? Yeah, I'm done. All right, thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, well, I, I too am impressed with the comprehensive nature of this it's almost overwhelming, and I think that's one of the, it's both the good and the bad. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard for people to comprehend all of this. Is there any way of, I don't know, there is, a, it's a, it is complicated, it is comprehensive, but of simplifying it for the general public to understand that we're gearing to go toward better classroom effect and better student uh, somehow or other that's the goal and it says it at the beginning but it, there's so much that it sort of gets lost in the process I think uh, I don't know how to solve that problem well, I think we solve it by saying here is if you're an ISD this is what we're asking you to do if you're an administrator in a building this is what we're asking you to do if you're a teacher so that it gets down to how does it impact me and how about the public Yep. And business community has responsibility, legislature has responsibility, we have responsibility, you have responsibility. I mean, we're going to lay that out for everyone. Okay. Well, I, I think there's hey, still a problem for the ordinary citizen. Okay. Part of it is our messaging when we go out, and again, you're getting the whole piece of it. When we try to get the graphics and things to try to help understand that these are three big areas that we believe are very important with that infrastructure piece as the, as the fourth. And we wouldn't go into, we can go into as much detail or not as much um, detail with them. And that's, if we have those three areas, and that's why we did the components with the graphics to try to say, okay, in this area, these <coughs> 
are the four things that we will focus on. In this area, these are the four things. So um, we need a communication plan that meets the needs of our different stakeholders and our consumers. And then um, I think the use of graphics really can help too. But I appreciate the comments and it helps us to think of more ways to get our message out that's clear, uh, particularly to people that um, aren't educators so we don't get all educanese on everybody. Yeah, I know. So we tend to sometimes talk to ourselves, you know, and, mm -hmm. and we need the public to support what we're doing, not, not, not the ISDs, not the other business mm -hmm. schools, the people. So I, I, that concerns me. And, you know, years ago, I don't know, probably eight or ten years ago already, we adopted a policy on universal education, universal access. And somehow, the, the, I'd like to see the word universal in here someplace. It might be here and I missed it, but I, I'd like to see some recognition of that that policy is still guiding us, which I think it is, but it's not explicit enough for me anyway. Liz Bauer is watching and she's <laughs> very happy that he, because she is still guiding us. All right, Lupe and then Pam. Okay, <clears throat> well, I, I congratulate you for this document. Where we started from and where we're at today is a big step. And I know this document is, is lengthy, but as has been pointed out, this is a living, breathing document that's going to take 10 years to implement. So, of course, it's lengthy because it's a 10-year uh, document and I, I like your explanation of how you go about explaining and presenting this to uh, the public uh, because you don't go with the whole document you go with specific areas just like when we speak in, in different uh, audiences we don't say the same thing I say to Latinos as I do to my African-American friends or or the union versus a business we tailor our presentations to the audience. So I heard you loud and clear that that's what you're doing with this document. I, I personally, as a, as a board member, feel very privileged to be here sitting at this table uh, with this document in my hand uh, because we're it, it going to the right direction to put some specific goals, focuses, in what's happening at the ultimate level, which is the classroom. And, and I loved how you said the teacher. I, I should have tell it how many times you said teacher because that's music to my ear. As far as I'm concerned, the teacher is a heartbeat of any school district. And so uh, I appreciate that you emphasize this a document being emphasized all the way to the classroom level and ultimately it's the, the students that are going to benefit from all these things that we're doing. I expect this document to be developed to a different level next time that you all present. So I like how you're doing things in a very progressive, uh, intelligent manner. Thank you. Thank you, Lupe. Pam? I was just going to quickly ask, do we think that we need to add a glossary around the process? Um, maybe differentiating what a goal is from a strategy measure. Um, I think that that would be helpful, um, at least for me. Sure. All right. Thank you. Good conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you, Norma Jean Stevens. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next up is a presentation on the Michigan uh, Education Finance Study. Uh, as you remember, we at the uh, state board through you created a committee to look at school funding reform and that committee came up with 12 different priorities. Subsequent follow-up of the committee members identified three top priority which was needs-based funding, equity and capital funding. With regards to needs-based funding, the committee feels that the current funding formula does not adequately reflect the higher costs associated with educating low uh, income students, English language learners, and special population students, special education pupils. With regard to equity issues, the committee feels that the discretionary in the per pupil revenue from district to district is inequitable, which leads to inequitable access to services and programs such as special education and career and tech ed services. With regard to capital funding, the committee found that districts with higher taxable values 
generate more revenue for capital spending than those with lower taxable values, and that creates an inequity. So that was kind of the committee that, that we all put together to look at school funding. APA then was hired to do a funding study, and we'll hear about it in their words in a moment. But they too found some of the same things in terms of inequitable funding. They found that the variation in per pupil revenue and spending among districts is considerably higher than it should be, although we need to certainly congratulate under Prop A. We shrunk that disparity and we appreciate that. APA also found that Michigan schools finance system is inequitable when pupils, uh, funding pupils with greater education needs like English language learners, economic disadvantage, and, and pupils in special ed programs. While not specifically addressing the disparity in taxable value, the APA study did talk about the need to look at capital spending. So kind of the recommendations from both is that uh, both studies recommend that the per pupil school aid funding include additional funding weights for pupils with special needs. The APA study goes so far as to suggest that we weight at risk students economically disadvantaged via point three and point four additional funding for English language learners. Both studies found recommending further equalizing the per school funding formula with APA study going as far as recommending that the minimum should be 8667. Currently the minimum is 7511. So I think there's a lot of good things in the study and in both studies that lead us to continuing conversations on school funding and we thank APA for being here today and we'd ask the two presenters to introduce themselves and and give us the presentation. Thank you all for having us today. I'm Justin Silverstein with Augenblick Palatian Associates, and this is Michaela Tonking. Uh, APA is a Denver-based consulting firm um, that focuses on education policy, and we actually started as a school finance only shop and have worked in all 50 states looking at school finance issues across the country and then a couple international uh, projects too. So we have a long history of school finance, and we um, really appreciate the opportunity to come and present the findings of our study. Uh, we are hoping, if it's okay with you all, to blast through 45 slides. Um, <laughs> we're going to go as quickly as we can with still being able to hear us, so it won't be an auction. Um, <laughs> but uh, if we can go through those, and we're going to try to leave as much time as possible at the end for questions, and I think the flow will just be a little bit better if that's okay with you. Okay. Well then, quickly, what are our targets for today? Um, we want to briefly review the RFP requirements. I think the RFP was pretty prescriptive, and so we want to make sure you understand what we were asked to do and kind of what we weren't asked to do. Um, how does this study fit into um, what other states are doing as they look at their school finance systems? So how does this fit into all these other studies that have been done and are being done around the country? We want to examine um, each of the requirements of the RFP and talk to you about kind of how we undertook the examination, what the results of each of those um, <clears throat> studies were, and then finally we have a set of recommendations that came out in the study and we want to walk you through each of those. So the Michigan RFP required really a very data-focused analysis of the revenues and expenditures of districts in your state. So this was very much a data-driven revenues and expenditures uh, study. It was unique also in that it specified prior to us coming in even as, as a consultant what the level of performance would be to be <clears throat> to set for what districts would mean for success. And so that was just somewhat unique and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And there were two main, there were two sections to the study. The first section of the study really was focusing on those operational costs of districts, looking at all operating costs, but also focusing on what we call a base cost. And so when you think of a base cost, that is the amount of expenditure needed for a student, so really the resources needed for any student who doesn't have any special education, at risk, or English language needs. So really kind of what are the resources needed for any student in any school in the state starting and then we also then looked at what are the types of additional resources are needed if a student has special needs. And so section one was really driven um, looking at those revenues and expenditures for districts who are meeting a performance standard. Also wanted us to look at what they call the exemplary districts. So those are districts when being compared to like districts, not compared to every district, but districts who look like them who, that are high performing <coughs> and low spending. So we wanted to take a look at those districts. They're called exemplary districts in the study. And finally, we also looked at the equity of the system. It's kind of a classic equity study. And also it required looking at how do successful districts, so those districts who are performing well, how do they distribute funds to their schools? Because there are different ways that you could do. 
The second section of the study really was a focus on regional cost differences. So it was looking at what are referred to as non-instructional cost areas, so food service, transportation, maintenance operations, community service, and adult ed. But the lens was a little less about the overall scale. I mean, that was important. That would be the base amount any district would get. But it really asked to compare across regions to see if there were differences in the, co the resource needs for districts by region in these non-instructional areas. And then section two also asked us to look at capital, which we did really separately, and we'll talk about that towards the end of the presentation. So again, quickly, national context. Um, there are three types of studies in our mind that states take when they're looking at their school fund funding or their finance systems. One is what we'd call a structural review. There are equity studies and adequacy studies. A structural review really is just what it sounds like. It, it's focusing on how does the school funding formula distribute funds to districts? So what types of adjustments are, are it, is it making for student characteristics or district characteristics? What's the split of state and local funding? Just how is it being done? Really no questions on is it done right? No questions on is it enough? It is just let's take a look at how it's done, compare maybe to how other states do it, just to say, you know, does it meet some basic school finance principles? An equity study takes the lens of are different stakeholders, players, you know, different districts, students being treated equitably? Are they being treated either horizontally the same because they're the same? So two districts that look alike or two students that look alike, are they receiving similar resources? Are, they be, are there differences being addressed, which is vertical equity? So when a student has additional needs or a district has special circumstances, does the, does the formula address those? And finally, there's fiscal neutrality. And the way I often just think of fiscal neutrality is, <coughs> is it where you, is where you live determining how, much, how many resources you have available to serve you as a student, right? That's fiscal neutrality. You want to have a system that, you know, kind of the classic your zip code doesn't determine the resources available. So that's, when we look at fiscal neutrality, that's kind of the lens I keep in my mind. And then finally, about 20 years ago, there started to be adequacy studies. And they take a very different lens. Adequacy studies ask the question of, what is the level of resource needed in order for all students to meet all state and federal standards? And so that really is a different lens than just looking at what is happening. It's going towards more what needs to happen as, as a state sets an accountability target and accountability systems, what needs to happen. And that really was built on the back of this kind of standard-based reform movement. You had standards set for districts and schools to meet. You had accountability systems that measure how well those districts and schools are, are hitting those targets. And the other question, you know, kind of the third leg of the stool was, well, are there enough resources to get that job done? And uh, there are four approaches that have been <coughs> used or developed to measure that adequacy level. And the first is what we call professional judgment. That was developed in uh, Wyoming in the mid-90s. And it really asked educators from the state to look at their current standards and to talk about what are the resources needed. So not a per pupil amount, but start with those questions of how many teachers do you need? What kind of principal? You, you know, do you need principals, counselors, those sort of things. How much do you need in order to get the job done? Successful schools, which can only really look at a base cost, but it asks the question of, well, we can identify successful districts in the state. What do they do currently? Um, evidence base, which is looking at the academic research on what is being shown to be statistically significant in improving student performance. I always mess up I'm trying to say that. And looking at those resources that have been identified in research that are helping, and, and there's not research on every type of uh, person you see in a school, but there's a lot of research on teachers and counselors, things like that. And they build a model, and then they usually go back to educators and say, well, does, does this model fit the state that you're in? And then the statistical method, which Historically, it's been called the black box method by some, but it, it's getting much more robust and, and being used much better over time, which tries to get, <coughs> when possible, school level expenditure data and performance data of students and really run high level statistical modeling to try to determine what are the resources needed to meet state standards. So there's four ways you can do this. So then the next question really is, where does this Michigan study fit into that framework of structural review, equity, and adequacy? And we think that the study itself probably most closely aligns with a successful school district approach to looking at the resources being currently spent by districts to meet some 
levels of performance. The big caveat being that the RFP defines success at a level that might be below what you would see in some other successful schools studies across the country. It was the level, and we'll talk about it later, basically was you're above average. So your district is performing at an above average level for the whole state. Often successful school studies target higher levels of performance, and within our study, we did look at some higher levels of performance. Um, so that was the difference with the RFP. The RFP does require an equity study, and it looked a little bit at structure when we look at those non-instructional costs and that regional differences, but there wasn't a large structural review. So in order to really understand um, what was going on, we created a large detailed database with revenues, expenditures, performance data, and capital data. And this all came from, most of it came from the Michigan's Department of Education Financial Information um, database. And for revenues, we're looking at federal, state, and local sources. Um, both non-operating and operating. And then expenditures, we're looking at the base level. And then, again, that is not including any special education, econ economically disadvantaged, and EL students. That was then analyzed separately. <coughs> um, and so what happened then is the RFP asked that we um, dive a little bit deeper into expenditures and revenues. So we did a cohort analysis where we were looking at town, rural, city, and suburbs from the National Center of Education Statistics. And then we also did a capital and debt expenditures where we were looking at um, the bonds that were passed by voters and then seeing if the expenditures after the years that it was passed really linked together. Um, and then we were um, tasked with looking at performance data. So for each school district, for each state by grade, um, the study team collected 541 schools and we were looking school districts and we were looking at school districts not at ISDs or charters because we believe that was what the RFP asked for um, and so we examined this by levels of each test performance and changes over time to really look at growth as well and we were tasked with identifying successful districts and so as Justin mentioned earlier the RFP requires that the contractor identify districts that were above average um, performance level and APA felt that base standard might in the RFP might not reflect what it takes for all students to meet state standards so we created some additional standards to look at and the additional standards we were looking at districts that per performed well above the average. Um, we also looked at districts that had very high growth across those five years performance wise. We were looking at um, districts that had high performance for their special needs populations. And all of these, for them to fall into, for districts to fall into these extra categories, they had to meet the above average standard at a minimum. And so what we ended up with was 186 of the districts were above average and 58 of those 186 met some of those additional standards. And um, what we are looking at here is we also added an average need factor. And in order for us to come up with a need factor, we examined um, a district's relative need based on the concentration of students with identified needs in those schools. And so we are looking at special education weight of about one, um, an ELL of about 0.5, and at risk of about 0.5. Four. Just quickly, sorry to interrupt, Michaela. The reason that this need factor, and, and we're not, you're not going to see it as much here in the presentation, but we will talk about it. It comes up a lot in the report. And it's for us just a metric on measuring the level of need of a district as we did all of this data analysis and comparison. And so it gives us a feeling as we're looking deeper in and we're starting to separate out, separate out districts for those who meet some of these um, performance standards and those who don't. What does the student characteristics of that district look like? So are they similar? You know, are they serving similar groups of students? Or are those who are high performing serving higher or lower need? And those who are not meeting those success standards, higher or lower need? It gives us a feeling for kind of what does the population of students look like? And are those who are meeting success somewhat representative of the rest of the state? So it becomes very important as you read through the whole report. And we'll bring it up a couple more times. Mm -hmm. um, and so. We um, really looked into the revenues of both the districts that were meeting these standards and those who were not. So really getting a comparison of what was going on within the state between the different districts. And we looked at operating revenues broken out by state, local, federal, and other sources so we could really understand where the resources were coming from to these districts. 
And then we looked at um, the total operating expenditures per student, and so we're looking at base costs here. And this was divided into instruction, administration, support services, and other expenditures. And we then we also separately analyzed the special education, economically disadvantaged ELL students as well to really see where those expenditures lie. And we had, you're going to see today, we have um, outliers, but all the data you'll see today are excluding those outliers. There was 13 outliers, and those were districts that had operating expenditures that were over three standard deviations above the mean, so over $21,000. And the reason that we took these out was because having them in, it would have skewed the data so that our base expenditure would have been a lot higher. Um, so, and we did not have any districts, did we not take any districts that were spending below three standard deviations. Um, and so as you look here, you can see that um, majority, 60 to 60-ish percent, 65 percent of the revenues coming from the state, around 25 to 30 percent is local and the rest is federal and other. And you can see across the different standards that the, um, the operating revenue is around 9,500 to $10,000. In expenses or in revenue sources, and um, what we also notice, and you can see um, more on pages 26 through 29, is when we are looking at expenditures, um, successful school districts tend to spend more, and they also tend to have much lower need students than non-successful districts in each, and that's really important to realize when you're trying to compare the two different districts and the makeup and characteristics of those districts. Um, here we have the base expenditures and a total expenditure, but we also took out food services and transportation in that bottom line, which um, allows you, because we feel that sometimes food services is something that um, can end up being paid for through, its, through itself, and then transportation is um, something that is usually done differently in states. You guys include it, so we haven't included it in top, but we showed you what it would look like without as well. Um, we were also tasked with running a regression, and so we ran an regression to understand the relationship between performance spending and student characteristics. And the results showed that um, the demographics of students was a key indicator to district performance, and spending levels did not predict performance levels. Um, we were also um, tasked with coming up with a survey, and so we sent a survey out to all the districts who were meeting above average performance standard. About 50% of the districts participated, and the survey was looking at four key areas. Um, so we were looking at support services for special populations and kind of seeing what kind of interventions they had in place and how successful those interventions were and what else they might need to um, make an impact. And then we were looking at review of compensatory education and special education expenditures. We were also looking at the different revenue sources for these special populations, understanding how those were allocated, both from the district level to the schools, and what percentage were used for ELL and at-risk students, so we could really understand how the expenditures were used. And so we found um, some commonalities in the types of supports and services provided to at-risk and ELL students. We also found that on average the weight for at risk was 0.11 and for ELL it was 0.24. And this is lower than the weights that are recommended by many national studies and it's lower than what we see adopted by, currently being adopted by states. All right, <coughs> we are over halfway through. <laughs> um, we are moving very quickly so we know there will be a lot of questions but we will get there pretty fast. Um, the next section is this cohort analysis and so again, the RFP required an analysis of exemplary districts by cohort. This is probably to me the most confusing part of the report to kind of read through and understand exactly what was happening. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time just trying to lay out what we're, we're doing here. The underlying um, concept is very, very straightforward. You're looking for districts who are high performing and low spending in relationship to districts who are like them for on some sort of characteristic. And so we used above average as the standard, because that's the standard that was set in the RFP. So we're looking for any district who's meeting that above average standard. Within, we actually created three sets of cohorts using different district characteristics. And so the first is density, simply looking at what is the, the number of students per square mile in a district. And that's a good representation really of somewhat if you're rural or urban, not totally that way. Really it's just what's the, how spread out is your district? So how many students do you have to serve based on your land size, right? So a very 
highly dense population, often urban, is going to have a lot of students per square mile. A very rural is not. But it's not always perfectly aligned to rural, which we also use. So we want to take a look at that density. We're looking at need. And so again, that's that need factor that we created. Um, so how do the lowest need districts compare to one another? How do the highest need districts compare to one another and in between? And then we use setting. Um, the National Center for Education Statistics uses, there's actually 12 categories of setting that you can break out by into four. It's city, suburb, town, and rural. So again, how do rural districts compare to one another? How do towns, how do suburbs and cities? So we looked at all of that. And for each of these, we broke them out um, for density and need. We broke them out into five pretty equal groupings. Setting, of course, is not going to be as equal because that's just a definition of where you are. And so there's far less city districts than there are town or rural. And as you run all of this, you're looking within each group, so within the, you know, the five density groupings or the five co co uh, need or the four setting, what became clear is that those exemplary districts, those who are high performing, so meeting the average standard, but the lowest spending within the group, <coughs> um, they really have much lower need than those within their same grouping that don't meet that performance standard. So you tend to have higher performance when you have lower student need. It's not shocking, right? The regression told us that too. We, we've all kind of known that. The amount of difference in need was pretty shocking to us. And you can look at pages starting at 55 in the report. We don't have to do that right now. But go through and look. And, and the numbers get a little hard to compare, right? So uh, an average, let's say a need factor is 1.4 and another need factor is 1.2. Well, to all of us, that number doesn't look that different. Well, you actually want to subtract the 1, because everybody starts at 1. So if you have a 1.4 versus a 1.2, that means a district with 1.4 need has twice the need as somebody with a 1.2. And we are often talking about the differential being 50% or higher in need. So when you're very high performing, you tend to have much lower need than those who look like you for some characteristic and who are not meeting that above average standard. So that just was it really stood out to us in looking at the data. And this was true, oddly, even when we were comparing districts on need. So right, we are putting in all these districts together based on their need being alike. And those who met the standard still had lower overall need than those who didn't. So there's something going on there. Again, the regression shows that. And then what also stood out is within the highest need cohort, nobody meets even the above average standard. So at your highest levels of need for districts, they are not even able to be above state average. No district could meet that. And that's like a, that was within 100 and something districts, right? So it wasn't just 10 districts we were looking at. Um, again, exemplary districts absolutely have lower revenues and expenditures. You know, they do well on less money. We just as a study team really do question if they are the right group of districts to look at to set a base amount because they look so different than all the other districts. So now we're moving on to equity. And again, we're looking at horizontal equity. So how do similar districts or students compare? Vertical equity, how well does the system take into account differences? And then fiscal neutrality, um, how well does the state take into account the fact that there are different levels of wealth in districts to raise resources and then compensate that for that within the system? And these include federal dollars. So you, you know there, there's some compensation there too. Um, some of the results here. The overall um, results of the equity analysis say that the system is moderately inequitable. Isn't that a great, you know, uh, really specific term? What we really were finding is that the horizontal equity and the vertical equity, we have some real questions about. So similars aren't being treated similarly as well as we'd like to see, and vertical differences really aren't being addressed as well as we'd like to see. But where, you know, there's this in the school finance literature, there's this really fine dividing line on fiscal neutrality, on how well does the state ensure that where you live doesn't determine the amount of resources you have. And Michigan's right on the edge of being okay, right? So they're right at that 0.5 on either side in the couple years we analyzed. What is worrisome for all of these statistics is that they got worse over time. So we looked at 09, 10 through 13, 14, and it's getting worse. It's not getting better. Prop A, at some level, you know, brought everybody together other than those outlier districts, right? You, you really had a compression quite a bit on what's available to districts. That should help equity over time. It's yet you're still get, seeing some slide out of that over time in what we're looking at. Um, just some quick numbers that you can look at later, just so you know, you have a 70 to one difference in um, 
per student taxable value in, from your highest taxable value district to your lowest. It's pretty big, right? You're talking $35,000 per student versus 2.5 million. That's not unusual, it just means the state has to take that into account as it's building its finance system. Um, what it does lead to though is some taxpayer inequity. You have some taxpayers paying close to 30 mils, kind of impl implicit tax rate of 30 mils, and some under one. Right, so you have, you have a huge difference in your tax rates that you might have to have because you have huge differences in the, um, the amount available to tax on. Your revenues have a pretty high spread, not massive, but high. And then the amount um, per student for current expenditures, there's a three to one difference in what's being spent. And this is excluding the outliers, right? So that's not including those 13 districts who spend much higher. You would have a wider range if we included those. Um, then if you just look at wealth and you break districts again into quintiles, um, so you're breaking them into five groups, what was good to see is that your lowest wealth districts did have the highest level, um, did, they have the highest level of student need, which we'd know, but they also have pretty high per student spending. So that's a good thing, right? You are taking in that one instance into account, they're spending about the same as most of the other wealth quintiles. But when you get to your wealthiest districts, even excluding those outliers, they have more. Right, and so that's where you start to have some problems with your fiscal neutrality. Um, and that there's a relatively weak um, correlation between wealth and the salaries of teachers. That was a surprising finding for us. Instead, what you're seeing is the wealthier districts have more teachers they don't per student. They don't necessarily pay them more. So they have more, they're using those dollars to have more resources, not necessarily to pay more for the resource. We can't tell you why or how or what's going on underneath it. It's just true. Um, with the data we have. And so that really ends our section one discussion. We're gonna move over to section two, which are that focus on non-instructional costs with a real focus on what are the differences by region. Um, I'm gonna try to catch up on my notes here. Um, so as we're taking a look at this, again, the RFP wanted to focus on being able to set a statewide benchmark and then adjustments by region for non-instructional costs. That was one of it, the goals of the RFP, and one of the asks. So we identified 14 regions in the state. We used the Michigan State Planning and Development region, so the spider regions. Um, non-instructional expenditures include food service, transportation, maintenance and operations, community service, and adult ed. I will say up front, community service and adult ed, the, they're very low amounts per student across the state. The variation is huge. A lot of districts don't even have those expenditures within the data we have. So we analyzed them, but there's nothing really to analyze. There's not good enough data to do anything. So the focus of the analysis was on food service, transportation, maintenance, and operations. And those are pretty large expenditure areas. So you would kind of, you know, those are good things to focus on. As we did this, we looked at the expenditures per pupil for every district within a region and compared the regions to see, you know, are you seeing some consistent levels of spending in the region? and then we compared the regions against one another. What really came out though is that the, diff the, the variation within region is extremely high. And so as you start to compare, you can see differences, but what you know is that the comparisons, they're kind of not real underneath there because you can have a district who's spending nothing on transportation in a region that is 50% you know, higher than the statewide average, right? So if you created a regional benchmarking difference, you would be paying a district for transportation, who doesn't have any, 50% more than everybody else in the state, right? So at some level, and we'll talk more about it in the recommendations, you need different data when you're looking at these kind of categories to understand what are the cost pressures for a district versus simply what are they spending differently? And we'll talk about that in the recommendations. Um, so there's very high variation within regions for all five and across. Um, we kind of already went through this. We did look at exemplary districts, and again, they do spend less in all of these areas than the non-exemplary districts, right? That's just a pattern that we see. Um, we, at this point, you know, we really question if you can make a regional adjustment on this type of data. There are other ways to make regional adjustments that other states use. We talk a little bit about that in the report. We're not sure this is the right way to do it. Um, next is capital and debt service. So the RFP itself kind of grouped capital and debt service together with um, these other non-instructional costs. What we know about capital especially is that it is very district specific, even beyond something like transportation often or food service or uh, maintenance and operations, because your expenditures tend to be about your willingness of your community to pay for it and the needs you have. So if you have a district who just went through a large capital program, 
you wouldn't expect to see any new capital expenditures or large capital expenditures in the coming years, right? They've just built a lot of schools. They've updated schools. So what we actually turn to is the Michigan State Bond and Loan Program, trying to identify districts within our time period of data we were analyzing who actually passed bonds, which would suggest that they were going to have capital projects. And we try to take a look at their expenditures to see, again, if there are regional cost differences that we could get from a purely data-driven approach. We also looked at a regression analysis to take a look at that. I am not going to read all the categories of capital and um, debt service that there are out there. There are a lot. Um, but when you think about buildings and additions, uh, facilities acquisition and construction, you know, those are the areas where you're going to see your larger expenditures when you're actually building a building. But similar to, to these non-instructional expenditures, variation was extremely high, even when you're looking at just districts who seem to be building buildings in this time period. The variation in cost per pupil is extraordinarily high. So we, again, don't think this is the right way to take a look at what those regional differences are. There are ways to do it. There's data you can collect. We, you know, we're going to talk more about that. We just don't think the data we had at this time is, is the data you would want to use. Um, and so that moves us to recommendations. Moving along. So I'm going to get through these pretty quickly. We would recommend your base costs come from those notably successful districts with once we've applied an efficiency screen. So an efficiency screen, we're really trying to take a look at for these districts, do they have anything that stands out as being kind of a non-efficient approach to serving students? So they have really high numbers of teachers per student. So they have really high numbers of administrators, really high m and costs, anything like that. If they did, we excluded them from this pool of districts. So we're trying to be, and, and we would exclude any district who also had really low expenditures in any of those areas, because you can be inefficient you can be overly efficient and you can be inefficient. The overly efficient screen is like two standard deviations away from the mean. Nobody was excluded, but we did exclude a couple districts who, were, who seemed to be inefficient in their approach, even though they are meeting these high standards. That gets us to a base cost of $8,667. I believe on the page when you add it all up, there is some rounding error in there, right? But this is the number, I promise. Um, I only got like five calls on my rounding error. That felt good. Um, and so that's the amount. This does include both transportation and food service. We want to reiterate, most, many states do not provide a just flat amount for transportation per pupil. They try to build formulas that are reflective of the actual cost of transportation. So that's something that you could think about in the future. We didn't make explicit recommendation, but I think it's important. We do recommend that you have explicit weighting for your um, ELL and at-risk students and that those, the weights we're recommending here don't include federal funds, those funds would still come in, but that you would have additional funding. You all have some data that floats around in the state, you know, they're very good reports, and Dan and Chris were super helpful. And you, you talk sometimes about base expenditures or base costs, but they tend to include some of your comp ed and ELL numbers in there, so I just want to make sure the numbers you're seeing at the base and these weights, they're a little different, right? And it would probably take some time working with Dan and, and Chris to make sure you guys could kind of the apples to apples approach. But the 0 .30 and the 0 .40 weights, those are relatively conservative weights for what are being implemented in many states across the country um, to ensure that those students with those special needs have the resources available to get the job done. We would recommend a uh, better tracking system for your special education expenditures. And that is in no way to say that you don't do a good job for your special education students. We actually think you have a relatively robust system between your ISDs and districts to serve students. It's just that tracking the dollars that go to kids felt, it was hard. Um, it, was, it was a tough task. You have ISDs who are serving districts. You have districts who are booking some expenditures for other districts because it's within the ISD structure. And we really couldn't get to a good number. And we talked to, I think, about everybody who's an expert in this in the state um, that, you know, to say, for District X, here's everything being spent only for their special ed kids, but it's everything. We just couldn't get there. So again, I don't think you have a bad system in serving students. I actually think you fund your special education. My gut is pretty well. We just couldn't get the data there. And this data thing is going to come up in a couple more recommendations. Um, we do not recommend setting their benchmarks on non-instructional expenditures at this time. Um, we, we do talk about that base cost figure from Notably Successful. And a big part of that is just we don't think the data we were analyzing tells you enough about the actual cost differences that you wouldn't be overfunding some districts and underfunding others, right? You, you aren't, we were not hitting a line of uh, you know, statistical 
you know, the variation was so large, we didn't feel comfortable saying, yeah, go do this, because then you're just giving out money in a way that we don't think statistically is probably right. Um, same for capital or debt service. But really what it becomes is collecting targeted data over time if you want to make these type of adjustments so that you know a lot more about the characteristics of districts on why they might be spending different amounts and really what's happening, right? So an example would be transportation. You know, how many bus miles are they running? What's the density of their district? Um, you know, why, why might they have higher or lower cost for transportation? For capital, how many square feet are they building? Um, you know, are they building a Taj Mahal or are they building, you know, a kind of a normal school structure, right? Again, the way we were looking at the expenditures, if someone's doing a great program above and beyond what might even be adequate, it would fall into this analysis, right? So you would be paying for something maybe beyond what the state feels it should be paying for. Um, so collecting more data. What we know, and we've talked to CFOs and we've talked to the, the department, you know, there's always this kind of, and it's not conflict, but it's just finding the fine line between how much work should districts be doing to turn in data and the type of data you want. I mean, really, every time you ask for more, that's a big effort for districts. And so I think you would want to come together with a group of CFOs to say, okay, what's the right data to collect to answer these questions and what's the easiest way to get that done um, before you just dive in and say, hey, give us more and more and more data. We know that within some of these areas, there are account codes where districts could report this information, just at this time they're not mandated to do that. Um, can always work to create a more equitable funding system. You know, with your current trend line, we would say it's probably important to keep looking at the equity of the system. If you start to implement, you know, some of the recommendations around funding, we think for ELL and for at-risk students or comp, you know, you, you know, your comp ed now includes both of those. So it's, it's comp ed as an umbrella, but we, we think of those groups of students separately. You're going to get more vertical equity just kind of by definition if you do that. You want to look at your horizontal equity, of course, and you're, it's always important to ensure that where a student lives doesn't determine the resources that they have to get the job done. This is the link to the study. I think you probably all have the study. Um, but we are ready for questions, and we are only four minutes longer than we have. All right, John. <laughs> um, thank you. An, an impressive um, explication of a very um, uh, complex uh, analysis. So thank you. Um, well, one, obviously, we've seen many of us here lots of studies, particularly some recently, about what drives education performance and where Michigan is. And you know, I, obviously, I'm happy that your analysis appears to reinforce. Um, what we're hearing from many different directions, including our own agenda, that it is effective to put more resources uh, around the needs, to meet the needs of kids who are further to travel, essentially, and, uh, and based on the cost of educating them fully, you know, I was also, which is what we're hearing from Massachusetts and their sort of differential funding and high-performing states model, um, and including, I was struck by, the poor kids have fewer teachers per student when arguably in Massachusetts and other places they put more teachers per student to help those kids go further. Um, and I wanted to ask though, you're, you, at one point in your um, explication you were saying you didn't see spending uh, reflecting, performance differences were not a function of spending. Um, but your, your sort of baseline funding recommendation you know, would, would take our baseline funding up for many districts as an important contributor potentially to how they can succeed. Can you, can you square those two statements a bit and sort of help us understand why that baseline funding, which, you know, makes sense intuitively, most districts are feeling they don't have all that they need to succeed, but there are wild variations obviously and districts with a lot of money that are so messed up they're not succeeding with anybody. But how do we sort of square those two statements in that it would be effective to increase learning outcomes for more resources generally to go into that baseline. Yeah. So um, you kind of, we have the two pieces here, right? Those districts who are your most successful spend at that higher base level. They have relatively low need, right? What we know is the, the higher performance you are, the lower need you are. Um, so that base level, that's, that's our target there, right? We are just looking at base in that analysis. You're absolutely right. It gets confusing. You run a regression, right? And you would always hope that you'd have everything run, lay out perfectly. But what the regression did clearly state is the needs of students is your highest predictor of how well the district's going to do. 
what we know is your highest performers have low need, right? So when you look at all that together, what it's saying is you most likely are not funding the needs of students high enough, in my mind, in order for over time to, to show that that higher spending for those needs students would provide the performance level. So for us, it's relatively easy to tie out. We know the successful places are at a base level spending that amount, and we know that needs of students is your best indicator of if you can meet performance and so you need to have the strong base, which these lower need districts have, and then you need to be able to fund for what really is the other biggest driving factor of if you'll be able to be successful, which is this higher need of students. So it, it, you're absolutely right, at first blush looks like it's somewhat counterintuitive, but I think when we look at it all together, it feels, it, it actually feels to, it, it says the right thing. What, it, what it's saying is that you don't have your high performers who have relatively lower needs spending way more, but that's in part because we took out those outliers. Right, some of that would have got shifted a little bit just by keep putting the outliers in. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Dr. Z, and then Eileen. Um, well, uh, a couple of issues. One is uh, the, the use of the term equitable, equitable funding. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, that's defined by law. Mm -hmm. uh, but in other cases, it's, it gets redefined according to the study, or, or mm -hmm. I've observed it in some studies where it's used in multiple senses. Yeah. How, how have you used the term basically in, in this study? And, and um, I can go back to the equity slide. This, as best we could, we, we tried to implement a, a classic school finance kind of literature equity study. So there's things like Gini coefficients and, and um, you know, coefficients of variation. So it's very statistically based with the metrics of what an outside lens, so regardless of what your state, let's say constitution says about equity, what would school finance literature say is an equitable system within the uh, metrics that they've, they've created over time to measure. So it is very much an academic equity analysis. Uh, I guess related to that, mm -hmm. my, my own experience as a principal, uh, uh, working with special ed students, some students uh, require the, the variation between the financial need of, of special ed students is mm -hmm. wider than, than the average special ed and, and your mm -hmm. uh, uh, non-special ed student. So how does one take that into account? How can one make, come up with a, an average need for special ed when in fact that mm -hmm. cohort is, is uh, uh, characterized by diversity as opposed to the average student, which is much more uniform. Yeah, it, um, so definitely our analysis is looking at average. So if you had, um, there's some weighted student analysis within the equity uh, section, which is trying to understand that vertical equity differences, which is to your point, what we weren't able to do and, and what we um, was to say, okay, for district X, they have 13% of their students, but you know, 50% of them are high need special ed versus maybe district Y who has 13% special ed, but 75% are more moderate need. We, we didn't have, we, we didn't go quite that deep. You absolutely could as you track equity over time, if you can agree on the relative differences in, let's say, level of service for different types of students and you have all that data, you could run these equity statistics at a, probably a little bit finer detail. Um, we, we, in plenty of states have suggested, you know, that the, sometimes you get to a certain level of detail where it becomes to imply that there's incentives built in to have higher cost students, things like that. We've never seen it, but we get that. <coughs> Anytime you dig deeper, you might want to think about, I, I would have less versus more categories, but definitely defining maybe like mild, moderate, and severe special ed is a way to get a little finer level of detail. Okay, okay. Um, and another uh, question which... Um Come back to me because then I'll remember my question. <laughs> no, no problem, Dr. Z. Eileen, please. Oh, I, I remember. What you remember. Was. Go ahead, Dr. Z. Did I understand you to say that charter schools <coughs> were exempted from this particular study? We only focus on the 541 districts for this study. So we're trying to, you know, and that's, we went back and forth with the contractor. We, that was our belief of what was we needed to do. In part, it is the most robust data set that you have, and you're not going to have individual you know, we're looking at data over time. You have charters that are coming in. They're much smaller units. I'm on a charter board in, in Colorado, and, you know, two kids doing something in a teeny tiny school, you have massive variations and swings in data, so it can get a little bit harder on the performance side. It also tends to be a little harder to get sometimes really good ex revenue expenditure data. Um, so we did focus on the uh, district analysis. In most places, as we do this, you would, there, you know, the underlying implication is that you shouldn't have massively different systems to fund charter versus traditional schools, right? There's students in schools and those would 
as you build a system would tend to align. Okay. Um, <coughs> I, if I have other questions, I'll raise my hand. Thank you, Dr. C. Eileen, please. Uh, Thank you for the study. I know that the parameter, if I designed this study, <laughs> if my wish list had been in, in command, uh, mine would have been talking about the role that federal funds play to support our state and local funds, which is massive, mm -hmm. for, especially for kids at risk, and the uh, what we have seen with these schools beating the odds because they're using mm -hmm. their money extremely well, the lessons that we wish we could get from them. Uh, academically and economically are lost in this study. I know that you did look at it, but it was not the focus of the study. Is that correct? So we, we did no school level analysis. It was all at the district level. So like a beating odds school wouldn't or be in here anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Yep. So then uh, I, I did want to ask you, Title Title One and uh, funds are for migrant and low income kids. Title Two funds are for teachers and principals on the job and training. Three is for immigrant limited English acquisition. Six is for rural, rural low income program. And then it's either nine or 10 that's for homeless students. My understanding in 2014 that was that that was close to a billion dollars. Did you look at all at those monies and how they come into the state? And we, they're controlled through um, block grant, not block grants, but program grants. The, the feds, and I know you weren't looking at pro student proficiency per se. You were using that as a target for your analysis for of financing and mm -hmm. equity, I understand that. But in, in this whole mix um, is a significant amount of money that goes in. If you look at the U.S. Census Bureau report of 2015 on 2013 finances, we're 20th highest for all sources of funding per capita, and we're 24th highest on spending per child. Uh, so how, how, you know, that's a much different picture, that 20th in its old data, it's mm -hmm. 2016, but what sense do you have? Did you look at the federal funding at all or was that not included either? So if you go back um, on slide 20, we were we, we did look at revenues um, and expenditures and on the revenue side explicitly included federal funds. Um, one of the highlights in, in the equity side is that that lowest wealth quintile, one of the reasons that they have pretty high resources is because of how much federal funding is coming in. So to your point, the federal funding is doing exactly what it's designed to do. It's, it's, it's treating, um, it's, it's helping with those at-risk and ELL <coughs> and special education students. It's not necessarily gapping everything. You know, we know that by definition, federal funds supplement. They, they do not supplant, right? They are meant by law to, to help, but not to do, right, it only, right? So you always have that balance within it. So there's definitely discussion in, especially that revenue section, a lot of discussion about where are the funds coming from when you're looking at both exemplary, non-exemplary, um, those meeting the success standards or those don't, and it, that includes the federal funds in there. As we look at expenditures, we tended to take those out, right, because we are looking mostly at base, and base by definition, maybe other than your PD in Title II, you generally wouldn't, you would not include federal funds in your base funding because that, you know, that those federal funds will come in to supplement that base funding. So I, I'm still looking for lessons that help yeah. us figure out what to do. Yeah. And I hear the limitations on the mm -hmm. study. And what I'm curious about, because we've heard reports of districts getting fourteen, sixteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 a student mm -hmm. and not being able to use that money well. So as we try to figure out what we can do for schools, not just in financing, but also in outcomes, yeah. there is... The, I, I'm not seeing, when I, when I looked at the bridge study, which I consider to be centrist left, mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the comments that they made was that, um, you know, a, it would take $100,000 to increase one student 1%, $100,000 a year, because it, you're looking at about mm -hmm. $1,000 per child to mm -hmm. raise student proficiency 1% mm -hmm. per year. So I, I look at this and I'm trying to draw a lesson from it that not only has spending equity, but actual outcomes. And I, I, I'm lost in this yeah. for guidance for the state board's actions. So I would say that probably the closest we get to what you're looking for is within the survey, one of the targets of the study was to really understand <coughs> what districts are doing for your ELL and your at-risk students. And, and what was interesting is those districts who are successful generally, they aren't necessarily just successful for those students, had very similar types of interventions and programs for their students. So you could go back and look at that. Now, we can't say that the scale every place is the same or they would do it <laughs> the same way, but those interventions also happen to align with what you would see coming out of professional judgment studies, so talking about summer school and extended day and those sort of things, or evidence-based, right? So you, you do see some alignment. 
when you get more towards an adequacy study, you, you tend to dig a little deeper into what are the types of programs and interventions that you might need, so a little bit more on that level. When it's a data-driven study, that's very hard to get to. The survey, I thought, was a, you know, a great way to do that, so we have some of that data. You only had 50% of the, of the districts, though. We had 50% of the, of the 186, which, as a sample size, is not terrible by any means, and, and we thank every district for doing it, and, and they did a great job. So yes, we do not know what every district does, but we know what, you know, basically a what a, a fifth of all your districts do, and they're all successful places based on the, on the RFP level standard. I get it. You know, we talk a lot about when you're building a school finance formula within this accountability and accreditation lens, right? You need to ensure that the resources are there. It does not guarantee that every district's going to do it, to your point, right? You, but, and then you need to have an accountability system that comes back and says, we can find what should happen, like how you should implement resources, if you can't figure it out kind of on your own as a district, right? There's this... But to come in and say, well, you're not doing it, and we have no idea if you have enough, that becomes a little harder um, argument to make because no one really knows if you even have enough to get that done, especially for those need students. So there's a balance, but we, we, we totally get it, right? Uh, Maryland, as they implemented uh, their study in 2002, you know, every district, in order to get new revenues, had to create a plan about how they would use them. And so it's that sort of thing. Now, they have 24 districts. It's a little bigger <laughs> lift here. Um, and so scale is always an issue, too, as you have... 500 something districts and a lot of charters and you have your ISDs scale you just have to think through as you implement on this level of scale what can you do effectively and efficiently thank you John and then Michelle or give the Michelle, Michelle? Just get in first okay. Michelle yeah thank you um, a lot of what you're saying it reinforces my anecdotal my, my uh, things I see in everyday life I live in Detroit and um, I've explored all sorts of options and gone and, as a board member at a lot of schools and I see huge discrepancies um, in what is available and, and it's clearly what zip codes you live in seem to determine uh, what resources you have. So, um, so it's validating and it seems pretty common sense to me given what I've seen that the districts with the less need seem to do well on standardized test scores which then the ones who are underfunded and don't have the, or uh, their needs addressed are not being punished with CEOs and closure and things like mm -hmm. that. So just making a, that's not a question, that's just a <laughs> point of fact. Um, so um, I, 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 I um, my question is around the MEPSERS and how that's been used sometimes as a, um, I know in other states it is not part of the calculation um, and that it's considered a separate expense from school expense, you know, the retirement program. And I, you know, I hear these huge discrepancies between you know, kids get $20 million per student as opposed to kids getting you know, like five, you know, I was on the, in the Detroit, I was on the um, policy committee that looked at uh, issues in, in the, yeah. <coughs> the interests on the bond, they looked at the, the huge amount of for special education, it was a huge amount that because they are they are overloaded with special ed kids, because charters tend to take the less severely um, affected kids, uh, and so they're and they have to dip into general ed funds. So, and I'm also looking at. Um, so I'm wondering if you can help me understand how I can hear uh, someone say that well the schools are getting twenty thousand dollars per child, where as others say. It's, oh, it's more like 5,000 spending in the classroom per child. So I probably cannot fully explain it. Um, you know, there's a lot of detail, especially in the state, with your ISD levels and things like right. that. Um, I will say, I, I think this, um, the idea of the pensions and, and kind of unfunded pension obligations and sort of, we were only looking at what districts were actually spending. So anything that they had on their books in that year to spend that is in our calculation. Now, if there are other dollars in the overall education pot, right, that aren't necessarily going to students and districts, but are there to pay for other obligations, that's not going to be in here, right? So you can get into that. You know, it all depends what you're, we assume that the denominator is all the same, right? We assume that it's kids, number of kids in your state. The numerator can shift around a little bit depending on what you include. And so that happens across the country. Some folks will include capital, let's say, in the overall pot when we know capital by definition is, for the most part, locally based decisions and local ability to pay. 
right? So it, it, it's not like that's evenly distributed across all students. It's happening for some students sometimes and not others. Well, if you include capital, well, then your number per student is going to go way up. But again, it's not distributed and it's not designed to be the same amount going to every student. The locals generally are paying for that. Um, if you take that out, that number is going to be lower. Uh, the feds tend to, on the expenditure side, take out capital, right, to compare operating expenditures. Um, on the revenue side, they don't really have that ability, so those numbers tend to stay in there. So it really is a, a, a getting to the table and coming to some agreement on what do we think is available for us to serve students today, and let's make that our numerator. But that, I can't tell you that everyone's going to agree on what that number is. For us, we looked at operating expenditures only when we're talking about base and those adjustments. That's just operating only available at the time for the students, whatever's going through the FID, you know, system. So, so can, oh, I'm sorry, can I just clarify okay, that real yeah, quick? Ahead. So what is it, 29 percent that the schools have to kick back for MIBSERS, I believe, on yeah, an annual basis? Like so, so your mm. number, the eight thousand, roughly 8,000 mm. then, would actually be an additional 29 percent because you're not counting in that the kickback to the state. We believe, and we've gone back and forth yeah. on this, we, if, the, if it's in the accounting system, which we believe it is, then it would be in the number. And but we, need, we should, we'll clarify that. We can get with Dan and Chris and get that clarification okay. for you back, because yeah. that's, we've asked a number of times, the retire, and we just want to make sure we're all right. on the same page. Okay. So, so I just wanted to follow up on that, please. So, um, so comparing state to state on expenditures is not a simple matter. Even comparing, you know, and it, maybe it's not a statistically valid mm -hmm. way to measure things. Mm -hmm. So. And also comparing district to district, it sounds like there's just so much variability that it's, um, I, think, I think it would, um, you need to be, what I'm hearing is that you just need to be very cautious and careful about looking at, at all these factors. And yeah. the make. What we would suggest is that you try to include expenditures that are relatively apples to apples, right? So when you talk about capital, those are not going to be apples to apples. They just, right. they aren't, for, for numerous reasons, um, both need and ability to pay get into things like transportation, that can be differentiate a little bit, but you put that in your system, right? And so trying to get as close as you can to, you know, everyone is instructing students, they're administ administering the district, they have MNO, all of those things, and we think we compared them, we think we compared them well, because we think you have a good finance, financial system that's collecting that data. It took a while, right? It was iterative to, to get to where we thought we had our best apples to apples comparison. It's why special ed isn't talked about much, because we did not think we could get to something that wouldn't be apples to oranges to like pizza. <laughs> right, like it was um, different enough that we just were not yeah. comfortable doing that. But you know, I don't think we shouldn't compare. I just think when you make comparisons, you need to be kind of intellectually honest about how you compare. So even state to state, what's cost of living differences? Um, you know, if you go to NCS, you should be able to get data that is relatively clean, or Census Bureau in collecting similar data. But you'd want to adjust for also perhaps student need, right? So if you have a very highly impacted state and a very lowly impacted state. What's available at the need level, not just per pupil to per pupil. There's there's ways that we are more comfortable with comparisons. We don't tend to run around quite as much on that. You also would want to over time look at what's the standard. Um, you know, back in the No Child Left Behind days, early on, you had states who had much higher performance standards than other states, right? And then some of those states paid for it, and some of them didn't. So you, you know, there's a lot that goes in the mix when you're trying to compare yourself outside the state, especially. Kathleen. Well, thank you very much for the study. And, um, as John said, this is something we've been looking at for a long time. And I go back a long way and learned that equitable funding is not necessarily equal funding. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, what you said reinforces that. And I just, uh, one of the things that, that struck me that you said in the, the wealthier districts, they have not increased teacher pay, they have increased the number of teachers. And they have done exactly what we say we have to do in the, in the low-performing districts and have smaller class sizes. Everything is reversed. If the wealthy get do better because they have more money. And they don't have the problems. They have more su successful families. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that that's, that's the basic difference, that they, the people have good employment and good income, and they and they have children, they give their children all kinds of advantages. And that's what's lacking in, the, in some of the inner city schools, maybe some of the most, some of the suburban areas as well. But so the, in my mind, what we have to do is look at, for, first of all, we have to have adequate funding. That's the basic 
something that we're lacking. Yeah. In, in my mind. In my mind. <coughs> and then how do we get the emphasis reversed so that the people that have the most don't get the most, and the people that have the least don't get as much. I mean, they get a lot and they get federal funding, and that's true and all that. But the deeds in some of those areas are so huge that I think a lot of people have no idea how desperate some of those families are and, yeah. and how much they need more than just good teachers. Mm -hmm. They need all kinds of social services. They need health services. They need they need counseling, they need all kinds of things that go beyond just the school room, it seems to be. And I think you bring up a very good point when we talk about, in certain communities, the level of need. I think it's also important as you build a system to, to identify what are services that students need but shouldn't be provided by the education system and what are services that should be within the education system. And, and that's a tough line, right, because we've built accountability systems that expect the same thing from every student everywhere. And regardless of what they start with. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity gap can be massive, right? Um, there was an ad, I think, on the Olympics where we've been amazed by the ads on the Olympics <laughs> that um, must have been from, I don't know, toothbrush companies. But it was, you know, if you have high levels of oral deficiency, so if you have bad teeth, you're three times more likely to miss school. Well, that's a real issue in many communities, but should the districts pay for that or should you have more of the community schools kind of approach where the, the, the schools help students get those services to ensure right there's a lot going on in order to make sure your, your certain districts can succeed and it really takes the village kind of idea um, but we, we over time as a at school finance system have there's been more push into our resources on those sort of more social services lens so it's always important to try to figure out kind of where as a state, you would you kind of cut you, you draw that line, and different states draw it differently. You know, DC has very high spending, but they also have a ton of those social services within their system, right? So they're paying for different things than some other states. So, but I think that's a, a great point. I mean, those opportunity gaps really are what vertical equity are talking about, and you're expecting everyone to get the same place. So, how do you make sure you can overcome some of those opportunity gaps, both in education and, and then in health and human services? All right, we're going to, I think, close up with John here so we can so, move on. Um, I just want to sort of answer Eileen's question in part. Mm -hmm. um, what are the implications for us? And you know, I think part of our job is in the Constitution is to make recommendations about the financial requirements of schools, which we have done, but we should probably do again. Uh, and if we took from what people aren't debating about your study, it seems clear that we should be putting more money behind uh, the students who are further to travel to meet those opportunity gaps. Um, I would note that that's the opposite of what some advocate in this town around equal funding around each student. Um, and I would also, um, if we listen to Katie Haycock, some of us were at the Governor's Education Commission, we would back, we'd spend our money differently, we'd back our reforms when we demand higher standards for our learners, when we demand our educators perform better. They put in Massachusetts resources to train them, to write professional development, to build capacity, which we have not done, mm -hmm. even on school turnaround. I mean, uh, we did not hear that we put state money to support educating teachers in poor performing schools. But I also, um, I just wanted to flag for everybody, given this didn't look at charters, you know, there is another huge financial dynamic that is unattended to in this study. As you know, we have a state fundings model that relies on a foundation grant. We now have um, a declining K-12 population. It's been declining for a dozen years. 200,000 fewer K-12 students. Mm -hmm. We have an expansive choice and charter and virtual school expansion. So we have 300 almost more schools, all chasing fewer students. And when districts lose 10 or 20 or 15 percent of their students, they lose all those dollars. And often, as we see in Detroit, they're going to schools that don't necessarily educate them any better, often worse. And you see this, the financial implications and the learning implications of that dynamic are huge. Um, but I, I hope we will all take away one thing from this study, which is we should be spending more money to close those opportunity gaps of the kids who have further to travel. All right, thank you very much for being thank here, you. for the doing the study and sharing thank the you. information with us. Very much appreciate it. We are uh, going to move on to the Every Student Succeeds Act uh, update. This is our opportunity to rewrite uh, our future and where we want to head. 
Uh, unfortunately, Vanessa, you're going from 45 minutes to 25. So uh, speak fast. I always do. <laughs> But really, truly, uh, Vanessa and her team are leading three, 350 people uh, from parents, business community, teachers, educators, through a process to make some recommendations for us to consider. So a lot of good work going on. Thank Vanessa. you, Superintendent. And thank you, Board. And I will, I know I stand between you and lunch, and it is a thick yes. presentation. Uh, but luckily, I wasn't planning on reading the whole thing to you anyway. We were already going to hit the highlights. So we'll hit even a higher level of highlights. We did want to make sure you had all the information though because it does represent the work of the nine action teams and as the superintendent just mentioned over 350 stakeholders over the last well we had about three weeks of active design before we paused for a period of feedback and reflection which is what we're in right now so wanted to make sure you had the information um, i'll highlight a few things but we will go relatively quickly uh, just as a reminder uh, I wanted to, to set on the guiding principles for a moment here. Um, the first is that ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, it's, it's our negotiation with the federal government for the funds that come with that. Um, and as such, it is a chance to rewrite some important things, but it, it is also, we have from the beginning said it is, a, it is one of the vehicles that will help us enact the 10 and 10, but it's not the whole thing. So the analogy I keep using is a tapestry. If the 10 and 10 is the whole tapestry, ESSA pulls certain threads. So the threads have to be part of the bigger picture, but they're not the whole picture. Uh, at the same time, we have to make sure they're very aligned with what we're trying to do overall, or else it won't be that final tapestry that we're looking for. Um, it is, we, are, we do see it as an opportunity to change the way we do business around some of the uh, areas related to things that have been required by the federal government over the, over the past. So this is the not exciting part of it, but things like your consolidated application to get federal funds, um, things like monitoring and compliance and technical assistance, all of these are kind of the day-to-day -day business that school districts and the department engage in. And we keep using the analogy now of kind of cleaning out the closet there, pull everything out of the closet and figure out what we're going to put back in, or maybe we need to put some new things in there so that we have a more streamlined approach. Um, our guiding principles here are very important that the student is at the core and we talked about this before but not only their outcomes but their opportunity to learn and their opportunity to access meaningful services so thinking about this again far beyond simply assessment and accountability but uh, in one of you were I think Michelle you were talking about or maybe Kathleen was talking about this on the last presentation that for many of our districts and students it's not enough to just say oh your test scores are low it, we have to look at what those students need to be successful and it's a much bigger picture um, than we perhaps have thought about it in the past at least in terms of our federal plan so while assessment and accountability are important they're just vehicles and mechanisms to help us achieve that goal of putting the student at the center um, we are the other thing I will say before we get into this is that um, assessment and accountability do remain as part of this plan and certainly the superintendent has provided a great deal of vision over the last year about where we're going with that but we really want to make sure with this that we um, we learned from the last 15 years of high stakes assessment and accountability and we understand that simply more labeling and more identifying doesn't necessarily change the situation for districts and for students in those districts and so how are we going to use assessment and accountability to target supports in new ways and move toward a more differentiated model of supports where our highest needs district get the greatest level of supports from us working in a partnership model uh, where we bring lots of partners to the table uh, school boards the ISD, education organizations, community members, other state departments. Um, again, the, the, um, the presentation just before talked about not everything that we need to invest in education will come from education, but we need to all be at the table together to make sure that those services are aligned. Um, so most of our attention and technical assistance is some of our highest needs districts. A little bit less as you go up the continuum and then for kind of higher performing districts, uh, focus on the key policy pieces of the 10 and 10, but also kind of Spend less time helping people who maybe need less help and more time helping those who need it, more time and resources. So it's a do more with some and less with others, but be more specific and targeted. And again, that mirrors what we try to ask teachers to do in classrooms, right, and schools to do with their students. Uh, appropriately target supports and services to those who need it most. Brian mentioned, uh, sorry, Superintendent mentioned stakeholder engagement. Uh, Brian is fine. <laughs> Um, we are in a massive period of stakeholder engagement. Michigan actually got kudos in Ed Week the other day for our, 
our excellent stakeholder engagement plans. So I like to say we're top 10 in 10 in stakeholder engagement already. <laughs> uh, we need a metric for that. Um, this is our website. If you haven't gone there, you should. And if this works, I'll be able to show you. Yay. This is always the part of presentations where you're not sure. Um, and you should be directing people here, everybody watching. I'm sure the live stream is just filled with people right now. Um, to the Get Involved page, we would like you to sign up for our virtual parent focus group, teacher focus group, for our virtual paraprofessional focus group. Thank you to the MEA for pointing out the need to have this. So we, we just created that. Um, and also, it is where you can find new information and take our, right now, we have our online survey open. So this is part of our wide public participation right now. Um, again, we have 350 groups involved, but we now want the, the general public to be taking this, um, this survey as well. So there's our webpage. I won't belabor this point, but remember we have a diverse coalition of people working on this. Um, external, internal, nine action teams, a tactical review team, our internal team, we've got the legislature and the governor and everybody working together. Um, and this, I won't read this to you, but you should see, these are all of our external partners participating in our ESSA work. So it's a, it's a very comprehensive list, it's very exciting. Um, you know, having done, been engaged with this work specifically around kind of these federal plans for a number of iterations, uh, the first thing I ever did with the department was our second race to the top plan, so I've done a little bit of this. I think this is our most comprehensive um, stakeholder engagement and also the best conversations about the bigger picture. So I'm excited about it. Hopefully you are too. Like I said, right now we're in a feedback period. Concepts are out there. There is that survey open. We really want everybody to take it. So please ask your friends, take it as a parent, take it as a board member, take it as a citizen. Um, there are also concept papers that sit there so you can kind of read what we're asking about and then answer the questions. And then we'll compile all that information and starting in about September, we'll go through a second round of revision where we put more detail on the plan. Just to remind you, this is our journey. We're right in that phase two right now, um, gunning for a November, December finalization of this part of the plan. I want to echo what the superintendent said. The team here at the department is doing a phenomenal job pulling this together. A huge amount of work, like, uh, every department, every division, every office is involved. And then again, 350 people serving on committees. So thanks to everybody who's being part of this. And I already said this. Okay. You have now detail from every one of the nine action teams, which, like I said, I didn't have time to talk about even before my time got cut. So I'm going to very briefly highlight a couple things, and then we'll go back to questions um, that you might have, or we can answer them in a different uh, venue offline or in another meeting. Accountability system, the major thing to know here is that uh, we are moving toward a letter grade system. Uh, what's important, we know that letter grading is very important to many stakeholders. It's a transparent uh, way to approach communicating to parents, and we definitely want to be at the table and, be, and design what goes into the system. So the important thing is moving toward that, working toward a, um, we've talked about it being calculator friendly so that a parent could sit down and understand how it all added up. Right now we're looking at the system being comprised of five components, achievement and growth, that's on state tests, uh, graduation and attendance, possibly something around chronic absenteeism, English <laughs> learner progress, that is something that moved out of Title III accountability as a separate thing and into Title I. And then this new indicator for school success. We don't know what that is yet, and that's a separate action team, but some non-test-based indicator for how schools are doing. Subgroups will remain very important. Uh, we have to hold schools accountable on the performance of all their students, but we also have to do so in a way that is transparent and easily understood by parents, by community members, and by the schools themselves. We do have questions for discussion. Again, these are on the survey, so you can answer these on the survey, so I won't read these to you, but we're looking for feedback on assessment participation, how we should handle consequences, on how we should weight these things. What's the most important thing of these five factors, proficiency, growth, graduation, what's most important, what should carry the most weight, what should carry the least weight? Um, we are looking at, ESSA does not require a district level overall rating. We think we probably want to do a district level overall rating, so you would have a, a grade at the district. But again, looking for feedback on that concept. And then a very specific question about end size for subgroups. So at what size is a subgroup big enough that you should be held accountable on it? Again, I know that I am blazing through this. I, am, I do apologize. 
but we'll, we can we can dig in on any part you want. Additional indicator of school quality and student success. That is what I mentioned before. That is that fifth. It's we've kind of the shorthand is that fifth indicator now, or that additional indicator. What else should schools be measured on? The task to this action team is to figure out all the things we think we want to know about schools. And then which ones should make you an A school versus a B school, and which ones should simply go on a transparency dashboard. Um, so a good example is um, student engagement. Obviously student engagement in school is highly important. It's also highly difficult to measure. And if you had a low student engagement score, should you be a B school instead of an A school, or would it be a good thing to report on so that schools can do continuous improvement around it? So that's what this team is working on. They have lots of questions, and so you see here how important is it that, and they run through all the ones that they've generated. So student success, educator engagement, school climate. Um, again, this is all just kind of around, we all agree that it shouldn't be just test scores, but what should be the other thing that drops, that moves your grade up or down versus what should we just know about because it will help us improve. We, we, you know, all these things are titled with an A, and they're, all, they're the hardest ones. So we always really start the presentation with the, the heavy hitters. Assessment implementation. Um, again, you know, there's been some questions. Is ESSA really different than NCLB? Yes, it is quite different. And also our state's approach to it is very different. We have not sat down with the regs and said, what do we need to do for the regs? We have sat down with the 10 and 10 plan and said, what do we want to do as a state to implement this plan, and how do we use this opportunity in support of that? That being said, some things remain. Assessment is one of them. Assessment main, uh, remains part of the federal plan. It remains part of our state system as well. So again, you've talked, the superintendent's talked a lot at this table about vision going forward for assessment implementation. So this team is really working on how do we get to implementing the vision. We want to reduce that overall testing, or yeah, reduce the overall testing burden and transition to benchmark assessments in certain grades, maintaining a M-step-like summative assessment in certain grades. This is a tiny chart that I won't read you, but this shows our vision three through 11. Um, and then the really the key questions are around this use of uh, benchmark <coughs> tests to measure proficiency and growth, um, when we should move forward to, with the changes. The superintendent has asked that we be ready by 17, 18, and certainly the team here is working toward that goal. That being said, we're asking the community to engage with us on when, when is the change good? You know, we all know the difficulties of a assessment change that we're not ready for. We also know the difficulties of waiting too long to make a change. So looking for some good feedback from everybody on, on this. We also have a request for information out right now about benchmark assessments. So that will gives vendors a chance to provide us with information and uh, will be useful to us as we figure out some details on this, on implementing the vision. Innovative assessments. Again, the superintendent has outlined some um, very new ideas in terms of assessment and we as a department are taking this opportunity to step back and say uh, what kind what else what are all the things we've wanted to do around assessment that are a lot cooler than you know state provided multiple choice tests we know there's cool stuff out there it's what goes into the state system versus what do you do in other ways and what flexibility do we have so again this is a moment in time where we can kind of say what else could we do US Ed does have a um, Assess, innovative assessment pilot opportunity that is a specific opportunity with a lot of specific requirements to be a pilot state. But m we have learned as we've talked about this more, much of what we're considering, we wouldn't actually need to be a pilot state. We could just do it. Um, so we'll have to decide, do we want to get in that boat or just be innovative on our own without being part of the official pilot? Um, the main thing is we want this innovative assessment that allows for these richer measures of student learning and progress and that assesses a broader range of skills. So traditional state assessments do a good job at measuring part of the career and college ready skills, the parts that you can get to with questions on a test. But if you think about what those skills represent further up a continuum, there's competencies, there's teamwork, there's all this stuff that's not easily measured by an assessment, but that are equally important in terms of teaching those standards. So how do we get state assessment to reflect all of that without it all being a traditional test? So some of the thinking is more, um, more, more work, more um, situation-based problem solving or simulations that happen in classrooms, more things that are locally determined or locally teacher scored that still create part of that overall picture of how a student is doing but maybe are handled and the data from it handled in a different way. 
So again, there's some questions here, but basically we're looking at just new different types, teamwork, problem solving, um, ways to interact with the standards, with information, and with each other that model what kids have to be able to do when they leave K-12, right? You, you have to problem solve, you have to work as a team. How do we reflect that in the assessment system and how do we have the appropriate PD along with it for teachers so that um, assessment can be used for what is really important, which is to drive instruction and improve student learning? School and district supports. You know, assessment accountability tend to grab the headlines sometimes, but the really cool part of ESSA is what we can do around school and district supports. So I talked a little bit about our, our desire to move to a more differentiated um, model of providing supports with a lot of focus on our highest needs districts. Uh, we want to make sure that all students receive this well-rounded education and that we address those social, emotional, physical, mental health, all of those needs as well. Um, and we want to change our internal process so we collaborate to ensure that the whole child is educated in a different way. There's questions here, um, lots of questions from this team about how, what kind of support do you think would be useful. Again, this is why we really ask that you take the survey because we would love great feedback on this. This team has continued to work and has done an awesome job mapping out, again with that closet approach, mapping out what's in the closet now, what might we want to keep, what might we want to throw away, and what might we need to go out and buy new, what might be some new things. Um, the main thing we're trying to do in supports as well is not, traditionally I think what we've tended to do is a certain program requires, parent engagement is my example I keep using, a certain program requires parent engagement. So then we end up with a parent engagement plan for that program and a parent engagement plan for this program. And, a, and really, we need parent engagement for the 10 and 10. So let's make a parent engagement plan that supports the needs of all the programs instead of four or five separate parent engagement plans. We can get more leverage from our efforts if we do them together. They have a lot of questions, so I'm not going to read these two. Teacher and leader quality. Um, it's a, I think I've said this at the table, but I'll keep reminding you all of this point. Um, ESSA moves away from certain requirements around things like educator evaluations from the federal level. Uh, that being said, we still have a state law. And as the action team has worked on with the question of what is important about teacher and leader quality, they've returned to evalu educator evaluations as one of four things that are really important for us to be aware of in terms of teacher and leader quality. Um, each of these focus areas is specifically addressed in our 10 and 10 plan and with various activities in ESSA. We have a concept paper for this action team. They were overachievers. They did an additional concept paper and, um, onto, uh, on top of all the other things we required of them. Um, the main thing in ESSA is that there is, there is professional development funds that come through a couple of the title programs. So we want to make sure we're using them in support of 10 and 10 activities and using them strategically. And we just realized in the last couple weeks, you know, it says teacher and leader quality, but when you get down to strategies, it often becomes what are the teacher quality strategies. So really escalating the role of leader and our investments in leader qualities and making sure that we come out with specific strategies around that. Um, the key things they're working on is equity, equitable access to effective teachers, um, educator recruitment and retention. You know, how do we get promising candidates not only into the profession, but into the places we need them most in the profession and how do we help them stay there? Um, career pathways, once you are a teacher, how do you keep developing? Um, what are some of the opportunities for advancement? Um, and then again, educator evaluation with a focus on driving instructional improvement and high quality observation and professional feedback. So how do we leverage the opportunities in this federal plan to really focus on that high quality feedback, high quality professional learning? That's the whole point of the evaluation system. Lots of questions here about what do you think? Using data to inform instruction. We have a whole action team around this idea that um, we can have all kinds of data from all kinds of things, assessment and otherwise, but if teachers and leaders and district administrators don't know what to do with it, then it is just a waste of time and it makes a fancy data warehouse so we can all point at and say we have it. So to leverage the power of assessment data and other data, people need to know how to use it. So this team is looking at reports, um, looking at uh, what type of training we need to do and how do we increase our data and assessment literacy so that everyone can leverage the power that data provides. Oh, that is the end of my presentation. So big, um, big so picture, <laughs> first of all, I'm going to need you all to spend some time reading this. Not that I normally like yeah. to give you homework, but there's a lot here. So we really need you to spend some time looking at it. But second of all, so big picture, you know, we're looking at 
including in our, our, our package, you know, looking at student growth. I started third grade, where did I start at? Where did I end third grade? And then we're also looking at proficiency, making sure that students are meeting standards. And then what we're doing is to saying to identify those high needs districts that have low growth, low proficiency, what's the number, who knows, 20, 30, 40 districts that then we will work with in a true partnership model where where wraparound services, the colleges, MASA, MASB, all the partners are sitting around the table saying, what is it we need to do to help support this district grow? So as an example, maybe we work in that process, we sign this agreement, and for 18 months we see if we're getting progress. And if we're getting progress, then we continue down the path maybe another 18 months. If we're not getting progress, or, or uh, at the end of the three years we didn't get progress, then we have to talk about what's next, the SRO or what's next. But it's really truly, let's identify the districts that we need to support in a new way, have a new way of supporting them in this partnership model, and really try to work together to get the improvements we need. And so there's a lot of great conversations taking place around these, all these concepts. Uh, and it's exciting that we get to rewrite our future in a positive way. So with that, I did see Cassandra and then Eileen. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just jump right in with the questions that I had when I, I did read through this. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so quick questions. One, um, on the accountability system, you have graduation and attendance. Mm -hmm. How is a school responsible for, or how do you make a school responsible for attendance, especially in areas where you have students that go to multiple schools throughout the year? It's not really the school's fault that that happens, um, and but they already get dinged in the achievement area because of those students that move around. So aren't you really punishing them twice for something that's completely out of their control? Um, well, let me just, before you answer, say as a local superintendent, we did concentrate on improving attendance, and there's things we put in literally starting in kindergarten through 12th grade because really bad attendance starts as early as kindergarten. So. We, you can, as a local district, improve it, but you're right, there are some things out of our control that we can't improve. But we districts can improve attendance, they can look at suspension expulsion data, and they can look at ways of helping, through wraparound services, parents get the things they need so kids can be in school. So there are some things we can do, but I still want, Vanessa, because you're, you're right, there is potential for a double ding there. Right. Well, on a technical sense, attendance is calculated as days present out of days enrolled. So for the students that you referenced who move around, if they were only enrolled 50 days, that's okay. their denominator. Um, I think the superintendent characterized it well that in our discussions, attendance is something that districts can Im impact, not entirely, but they can impact. And usually the threshold we set for attendance is 90%. So that gives you some room for, you know, things. Th things that happen. It's not 100% attendance. Um, that being said, I think the, the additional indicator team is interested in um, things like chronic absenteeism versus simply absences, uh, truancy, expulsion, suspension, that maybe we want to refine that attendance beyond just attendance to something like chronic absenteeism. Um, and the they do get, so let me address the achievement question too. Again, these are kind of technical answers, but they do get dinged on the achievement of a student who moves around in one sense in that if a student shows up in your school the day before the test, they take the test and that gets reported in your score. But come accountability time, that student wouldn't be because they wouldn't have been a full academic year there. So they would be removed from your A to F grade, for example, because you haven't had time to impact their learning, so you shouldn't be held accountable on, for their outcome. So they do and they don't. I mean, in pure reporting, you would see their score, but when it's time to grade you, we would remove them. Okay. Um, do, does the ESA, ESSA require subgroups? Yes. And, but they don't, don't give you the number, the end number. We get to decide they do not. that. Right. Okay. Is the 95% participation rate part of the subgroup? Well, so we have a lot more flexibility with how we implement 95% participation. Um, that's a complicated question because at the end of the day, missing the 95% participation has to do with, um, as a state, like that's when the, the US Ed would actually really be Oh, that's upset. a state number. That being said, we need to hold schools accountable on appropriate participation of all their students. So I think how we deal with participation across subgroups versus overall and how we count it is something we have more flexibility than we have in the past to propose something. Okay. You know, on the other hand, though, you wouldn't want to necessarily not hold everybody accountable on the participation of their subgroups because then it becomes too easy not to just say, let's not assess 
fill in the blank subgroup of kids you don't want to test. True, but, but if you only have an N of 30 and two students in that subgroup miss the test, what happens? Your entire school grade goes down at that point? Well, that's we have to figure out what happened. So even if we counted it, yes, how do we interact it with grade, with the grade, or is it a separate? Something we've talked about too is doing, and that's one of the questions, maybe assessment participation is a totally separate report. It doesn't impact the grade, because that's actually confusing to parents sometimes when you see all this high achievement and then mm -hmm. the grades a C and you're like, hmm, why? Um, so maybe we don't, we hold people accountable on it. So you can, we can even report on it and then have consequences if you're missing it, but not have it change that grade. If the grade is supposed to be transparent and easy to understand, then those are the questions we're asking. Like, can someone figure out how that happened? And if not, then what's the appropriate okay. One last question. Yep. The innovative assessment pilot. So yes. on one hand, it looks like we are decreasing the, the testing that we're doing in schools. And then it looks like at the same time, we're now adding more testing. So how do those two things um, correlate? Right, so the innovative testing could be a problem-solving component in, uh, and then we would reduce, the, the say, let's just throw out a number. Let's say the innovative testing, the problem-solving is an hour component, and let's say normally the test that you would give during that grade is four hours. Well, we'd still keep it at four hours. We'd reduce part of the test. So this can be part of the assessment? Yes. Reward. Okay. Yeah. Yes. All right. Because the overall goal is reduction. Got it. I'm going to go Eileen, and then Michelle, and then Kathleen. Thank you for um, an extraordinary effort. I can't, I, I, how many people do we have right now responding <laughs> to the department and to everybody else? It's an amazing thing. 350 on this? 350 on, on actual team. So okay. again, thank you to, if they're listening, there are a number of people in this room even who serve on an action team, an external advisory, tactical review, who come and sit at the department or phone in as often as once a week to work with us on this. So we're very grateful for that. Well, and I'd like it to be more. So how are we getting the word out on the survey? Are we contacting the districts and asking them to put it in their uh, home bulletins for parents? Yes. Okay. So we did. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's enough of an answer. We've done a, again though, if people have, I think we are doing an excellent job of getting to the people we know how to get to. I think the people who we struggle to get to, we're still struggling to get to. So we just sent out SNOs. notes. Uh, we're bumping it, to, uh, we're doing it through all the ed orgs, we're publishing it everywhere we can. I mean, we're really doing a pretty broad grasp, but um, if you have other ideas, we're always open, or other lists we can email, or other critical friends we can find, we totally want more too. Great, so. like Cassandra, I have a few drill down points, okay. <laughs> sorry, uh, because I now stand between us and lunch. Um, on the innovative assessment pilot, uh, I wondered, because any time that a state agency tries to do a brand new innovative assessment, mm -hmm. not only are there uh, tank traps and um, you know ambushes and everything else, and we've lived through that, mm -hmm. but you mentioned that there are some innovative assessments that exist. Are we providing people links to those within this process so that they can look at them and touch them? So many times, everybody's flying from what they know, but mm -hmm. they don't understand what they're reaching for when mm -hmm. they blindly say, oh, sure, let's develop something new. Right. Um, I think we can. I mean, I think we're still trying to figure out what we might mean exactly by innov And some of what we're talking about, it doesn't really exist, or it doesn't exist in a way that anybody has ever tried to use in this context. Um, so some of the teamwork ideas are something certainly that we do, but we don't do. And it's a paradigm shift, to Cassandra's point and to your point. It's saying this is all state assessment, but some of it happens in the way we think of state assessment, and some of it happens in a way we haven't traditionally, like it happens in the classroom and it's scored locally. That would be a shift, but we would make the claim at some point to US Ed that it's all covering the standards. Do you know what I mean? No, I think so, that's excellent. So anyway, um, so yes, as we have, exa I think you're right, it's hard to build, it's hard to get, especially when the state talks about it, it's hard to get people to see that you're talking about something different than the MEEP test or you know what they think of. So. Um, yes, well, the, we can share specific examples as we identify them or as we develop them. The, very quickly, the new technology engineering yes. literacy assessment that the National Assessment Governing Board has put together is stellar, but mm -hmm. I was part of that process, and mm -hmm. it took five, six years, I mean, six, seven, yeah. uh, and national resources. So as we look at this, it's important to recognize that some things that we would love to do and that children deserve right now are not yet feasible for yeah. the kind of money that we have. And the last time we tried to participate in a consortium that developed something, it didn't work. Yes. Uh, so moving briskly on to, um, let's see, I think this is Eddie Val. Uh, this is uh, school and district supports. 
I wanted to, I, this is just an open question, you don't have to respond, but I brought it up in top 10 and 10 earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the points is MDE will provide access to evidence-based strategies for all teachers. Mm -hmm. When I see things like this, given the mechanisms that we currently have and are allowed by state law, mm -hmm. it's unsettling to me because I don't know, we need it, but I don't know how it's going to be provided. So I just want to throw that out. And then um, on teacher and leader quality, if ESSA is moving away from educator evaluation mm -hmm. and we have a state law mm -hmm. that has sort of balkanized our schools because it allows multiple models, which mm -hmm. allows districts to be creative, mm -hmm. but it also really restricts the support that we can give, mm -hmm. both uh, in helping our ed schools prepare uh, uh, candidates who will be sliding into the same system of, eval mm -hmm. of evaluation in their school. And also, it doesn't get us to a spot where we actually really help teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so much of Eddie Vale in Massachusetts is, uh, you know, and Tennessee too, is highly trained evaluators who understand exactly what their job is mm -hmm. and a commitment from the whole system to make this a better place for teachers to work and to improve their skills. Mm -hmm. I don't see that in our current Michigan law. I wondered first whether the field is saying anything about that compl complexity, mm -hmm. and second, whether the staff has thoughts on it, and you don't have to share that part of it right now because I know that would be evolving. Mm -hmm. That is a really big question, and like I said, um, Educator evaluations is not something that we will heavily address through ESSA because it's not required through ESSA. And so um, I think this board has also said, don't put things in this plan that we don't need to put in the plan. So we won't do that here. That being said, as we onboard the new state law and we implement it, we're certainly running up against questions and we're doing implementation science. You know, we're implementing and we're evaluating plan, do, check, act is the cycle. So we're planning, we're doing, we're checking and we're acting. Um, there are things to learn, so we, we do have thoughts. Um, the main link to ESSA is, is the fact that if we're going to invest in professional learning and feedback, and feedback is a goal of the 10 and 10, and professional learning is what our teachers and our leaders need to be ready to do all the 10 and 10, then we should have a plan that brings all this together so there isn't the feedback and PD you get from Edivals, and then there's the feedback and PD you get from all these other initiatives that we leverage kind of the power of, a, of an investment in professional learning. In a, uni in a unified way. So um, I don't know if that answers your question entirely. Um, uh, you're addressing but, it. Yeah. You're talking about it, which is what I we want are, to find yes. out. Thanks. All right, Michelle, then Kathleen. Uh, hi, and um, again, I, I appreciate, <coughs> I mean, it's sort of um, overwhelming to me how, how much you're doing and how many people, how much you're getting, and trying to organize all the feedback and something that's understandable and um, respectful of all the different points of view. Um, so, but I, I, uh, I just had a couple of questions. And one is um, where it talks about um, that key idea number two, systems components. Um, I see that there's achievement and growth. So when it says achievement, does that mean just that's the overall test score? Uh, yeah, their achievement would mean proficiency on state okay, assessments. So how, how, how proficient they are. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then also the test score for growth. Mm -hmm. Is there any percentages tied to any of this? Uh, that's b question number two is what percentages should we okay. put it on it? Okay. And also there's been talk of a s more of a sliding scale where um, if the higher, the higher performing you are, the less growth weights or, you know, growth being higher in a district. <coughs> yeah. So there's a lot of ideas out there about weighting. Um, right now in the current accountability system, we're at 50-50, 50% growth, 50% achievement. Right. We've raised that growth percentage a lot over the years to try to take into account the fact that some schools are moving students forward who aren't proficient yet. So, But it's definitely an open question. I would say this waiting question is one of the ones we'll get the most traffic on and we're looking forward to kind of seeing where everybody shakes out on this. So, so the question, so when you're looking at growth, um, if there's a lot of turnover in the school, um, both in terms of students and teachers, how, how is that weighted or how is that considered? Um, you So on a student level, you can get a growth score as long as they've taken the assessment the two times. So currently it's one year to the next year. Wherever they took it, it, it does, you generate a score. Uh, when we move toward benchmark, it would be pre-post, and everybody would be expected to give the kids in front of them these tests so we could generate a score. You're asking a different question is if, you know, how does turnover impact test scores? Right. Um, I think that we probably, so it's not directly taken into account in those, those um calculations, but I think it's one of those measures we need to build into the transparency dashboard or possibly look at in terms of other indicators or something to 
quantify, because um, certainly it's, it's mobility and turnover is impactful on not just not just test score outcomes on a whole variety of things. Right. And like the superintendent said, we'd also like to work with some of our highest needs districts to, you can't necessarily stabilize student turnover, but you could stabilize staff turnover with some supports, initiatives. You know, how can we bring some more stability to systems that are really churn-based? Um, yeah, thank you. And, um, we also, um, not that I don't think English learners um, are important, but why just English learners are not at risk a larger category? Like special ed, right. English learners, and you know, at risk. So, um, so special ed and at risk, and all those other ones will be. That's the subgroups conversation. We still need to specifically talk about the achievement and progress of all the subgroups. Um, even though I try not to give this answer ever anymore, in, the requirement to include English learner progress is a specific requirement of ESSA because they eliminated the Title Three accountability and built it into Title One. So specifically doing certain target setting and work with English learners in a very visible way is something we do have to do. At the same time, like I said, um, we haven't fleshed out how subgroups will be used, but all the schools will still be held accountable on the performance of all their subgroups, including their students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, and the racial um, ethnic subgroups. And, uh, just one more question, and maybe this is for you. Mm -hmm. um, so when do you come up with the final plan? Is it subject to our approval? Or is it coming for the board for approval? Or is it going to be implemented without? Oh, no, no. You're going to be involved. I mean, certainly our goal is to have the you approve it, you, your blessing, the legislative blessing, the governor's blessing. We're trying to create a system here. Right. So the goal is absolutely you will be involved every step of the way and and okay. approving where we're heading. All right. I'm going to go to Kathleen and then lunch or John. This, this is really terrific. Yeah, but I wondered, so this, this is about the innovative assessment and the, and the seven states that can be mm -hmm. pilot states. What are the requirements to be a pilot state? Yeah. And would, I, I'm not sure I understand what the advantage would be if there isn't one. That's a really good question. I just spent time in Denver with a team here at a meeting about the innovative assessment pilot. And actually sitting with all these other states, we're all kind of looking at each other like, why would anybody do the pilot? We can do most of what we want to do without the pilot. And the pilot kind of locks you into more reporting to the feds, more th things. Um, the advantage would be, I think, truthfully, um, there are a couple things we might want to do in our system that U.S. said would not, we would not have authority to do without specific waiver approval. One is this choice of benchmark thing. If you want to have one benchmark and then another one, that would be something we would have to have approval to do. Um, the other is visibility. I think if you're an innovative assessment pilot, you get some visibility. There's no extra money for it, although there might be some competitive grants that they put out, and different organizations like CCSSO are trying to think about money for it. Um, so I think that's the question that we'll need to discuss with the superintendent with all of you is do we really, if we can do what we want without being in this official pilot capacity, then let's just do it you know that's better um, if it gains us something again if 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 we decide we want to move forward on a couple specific things we'll need the authority then we go for it or maybe we let some other state go first and see how they like it <laughs> <laughs> learn, from, <laughs> learn from them well, we had a, there was a meeting yesterday of the government affairs committee of NASB, mm -hmm. and that question of the innovative assessments was discussed in the, uh, this, in the seven states and who's going to apply and so yeah. on and so forth. And uh, the, another question I had was the, uh, the, <coughs> N, the N number, N size. Mm -hmm. which we had a big discussion about years ago when <coughs> we agreed to the 30. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it needs to be changed now or not, but that's what we're looking at, yep. obviously. That's one of the questions <coughs> for feedback, and it is certainly a time to change it if we want. We've been 30, we have had a 30 N size since NCLB started. Um, 30 was about average, is about middle of the road for states when we did it. Still is there, but all states are looking at it now, so I don't know how it will shake out. So, yeah, Another question that came up, was discussed yesterday, was the date of submission of the state plan. Mm -hmm. And I see you say we're going to be ready to do it and we'll be all set to go because apparently some states have asked for extensions and they said, okay, you can, not, you can submit it by July. Right. And uh, then they worry, well, well, if they submit it by July, the feds have 120 days to approve it, mm -hmm. and then they would get an answer before the start of the school year. But they, the answer to them is they should do it the way we are. Yeah. When, we, when do we expect to submit out? 
so you're right the current official proposed window for submission is March we want to be done well in advance of that with what we want um, part of the reason is we want to know what we want and then when they come out with final regs and any changes that might happen with elections or whatever that we can say we know what we want now let's interact it against the laws and make sure that we're they're not driving the bus we're driving the bus so we will be done by December done um, right. done minus any modifications okay. will go for the March window if we're and with some of our timelines for implementation you know the need to bring on a new um, accountability system by the next cycle we can't wait as long as some of these states are and with 10 and 10 and timing I mean we're just going to be we're ahead of the game yes we are we <laughs> want to lead no need to waste any more time bickering <laughs> arguing. no we can get it plus done, we so. want to design the system we want right that's right. the Which point good. right, right. All right, John, and then we're going to so break for lunch. On the school turnaround, um, I mean, you you described an approach of engagement and partnership model to lift those schools. Um, you know, we still have the SRO under the governor's office direction that seems to be um, favoring a CEO model almost exclusively, or at least that's what it sounds like. But I, it seemed like you were hinting at, are we making headway working together on one shared um, approach that's effective to how to do school turnaround and maybe even towards getting that functionality in one place again yeah I mean I want to I you know the functionality that's a question for the governor but in terms of heading a system creating a system where we're all on the same page moving forward that is the absolute goal to have that done absolutely um, you know in terms of uh, the SRO and whether it's that will office will ever come back that's up to the governor but we are working very hard to include the, obviously, we'll, the state board, the legislature, the governor, so that when we are done, we have a system in place that we have all bought into. And it is the direction of the state. So, all right, so it is 12.15. We will adjourn till 1.15 and come back to order at 1.15.